Hello. Hopefully, um, hopefully this is going to work out just fine. Hopefully you guys aren't getting some terrible, terrible echo right now. Um, oh yes. Boom. I'm sorry. I should have, uh, I should have, uh, made sure I had the boom. I've had some people saying, oh, where's the boom? I'm sorry. I owed you guys a boom and I screwed it up. So, um, we're going to see how well our video and so forth recaps work today because um, I've been having some technical difficulties and those technical difficulties mean that my um, my time stampage is wrong. So um, we're going to have a little bit of rough searching around because um, at the last minute I had to swap from using a, uh, a file to or one one link to using another one and so they are all um they're all chaotic so that said uh we're gonna get through all of this we're gonna talk about what's going on and um this one is um this one is exciting somebody says how late am i you are zero minutes late we just got started so um I was watching this today um, on all sorts of streams, mostly Emily's. I watched on Danny's. I watched on Legal Bites. I watched on Vices. I watched on all sorts of things. And um, I'm just going to say, um, and I see one uh, lawyer didn't seem to agree with you about bullets. I'm not sure where you mean on that, but uh, we'll we'll talk about the, the bullets because there's a lot about the bullets on this one. Um, I got a lot of thoughts on this one. So, um, somebody says, what did you think about Danny's take? I didn't see Danny's full take, so I don't know Danny's take. I saw bits of her stream. So I don't know what her take is overall. Um, you'll have to let me know. Um, I got my own take. And so we're gonna, I guess, dive right in. Today begins with opening statements and opening statements are um they're i mean they're important they are um uh, danny kind of defended hannah i then i probably disagree um so the prosecutor is going to give his opening statement and i'm just going to tell you the prosecutor's opening statement is acceptable and what i mean by that is he is competent in his opening statement he is um he doesn't drop the ball. He doesn't F anything up. Um, he's also boring. He's not exciting. He's not interesting. I think that his layout of this thing could be done a little differently. And so I, I wasn't super impressed, but I also wasn't like, I wasn't sitting there going, Oh my God, you suck. Um, I know I heard some people saying you guys like this guy sucked. And I'm like, no, he doesn't suck. He's just kind of uninteresting, right? He's just kind of, but I mean, he doesn't need to be showy. He doesn't need to be wow or pop or anything else like that. It's better if he is, but the prosecutor, I mean, to a certain extent, the prosecutor just being like, we're laying out our case is fine. Um, so his opening is fine. And that's, that's it. I think he did well. I think that there was no point in it. This wasn't like the Paltrow trial where we saw opening statements that just made me want to, you know, put a drill in my eye and keep going until the pain stops. Um, this was just one where I was like, and I mean, it didn't help that he was first off in the morning and I was sitting there, I was rocking like four hours of sleep and he came on and I was going, oh my God, I am going to, I'm going to just crash. Whereas, um, I mean, the Paltrow trial openings kept me entertained because they were so bad. <laughs> I mean, this guy was just going through everything and yeah. So let's, let's watch some of the key points of this. We're going to watch more of the defense opening than we will of the prosecution opening. Why? Well, because the prosecution opening is kind of boring and is kind of what we expected. So let's have a look. Um, I'm just going to take us back to about 139 here on our timestamp. 
and we'll see what this guy now chat let me know if you guys can hear him so the weapons that were in use at the time can you guys so hear him is the, the audio okay looks more authentic and so that would include finding old looking revolvers uh and shotguns uh and and things of that nature i've okay. just put up a photo this is the firearm that mr baldwin was using in this movie um this is also the firearm that was uh used in the incident that resulted in the death of uh miss hutchins okay so visual uh visual aids are good right we want to see visual aids uh i i'm I see people saying a bit too low. Can I turn the volume up? The volume is at max for that. So we're stuck with the volume we've got. Um, uh, people saying too quiet. Can I fix it? I don't know if I can. Um, I'll, I'll try to mess with it as we go. So um, somebody saying, will you be able to live stream Alec Baldwin's trial? I plan to. Yeah. So this is the gun. And I can say I own one that is exactly the same as this. I think it's actually the same finish as this gun, like this gun exactly. Um, he's going to get some details wrong about this gun. Uh, somebody says, are you going to go to Baldwin's trial? I might. Um, I'm, I'm very much thinking about it. So um, we'll see. All right, let's, uh, let's keep going because he's going to show us Baldwin's gun. Now, importantly, this is a 45 long Colt. Um, so yeah. One of the things that I think it's important no reason for, for you all to understand is that throughout this trial, we all may refer to these type of firearms this is important. as prop guns, but make no mistake, they are legitimate firearms. If you put a bullet, a live bullet inside of these guns, they will fire. So we sometimes refer to them as prop weapons, um, but they are absolutely capable of causing a projectile to fly out of the barrel. This is important because a lot of people have been talking about prop guns. Like that just means that they're like a toy and prop guns are not a toy. Like prop anything just means a physical object that is used on a, um, on a movie set. Right? So, I mean, you know, this pen, here let that once i find it this pen could be a prop on a movie set i mean it's not but it could be right and somebody in the movie could pick it up they could write something with it all of those things so a prop is just a physical object it might be a fake object like a fake like a rubber knife is a prop but it might be a real object you know you can have you know this knife is a real knife um you know not super sharp right now <laughs> but you know it can cut things um and i'm using it as a prop even though it's a real knife so i'd show you a prop gun but i'm on a live stream and youtube doesn't like that um i'd really wish youtube's rules were a little different because if so i could like show you the actual gun here at this stage um somebody says bench made this is not a bench made knife this is a sog knife all right, uh, so let's uh, let's uh, go to some other, or I think we're right at the other thing I wanted to show you guys here. Um, the other thing uh, that it's important for you all to know is that although the, this particular weapon looks old, uh, it is actually a brand new gun. Uh, this gun was yep. purchased directly from the manufacturer for this, for the purpose of being used in this movie. And now this actually surprised me because when we read, read the forensic reports, I don't mean surprised me today. It surprised me when we learned this like five or six court appearances ago. Uh, but when we read the forensic reports, this gun was so filthy that it was like hard to shoot projectiles through because it was actually narrowing the, uh, so it's like, how did this gun get so filthy so fast? Um, somebody says, why don't they use fake guns? Well, uh, for one thing, they don't make fake guns for a lot of the designs you might want. There's a million and two real guns out there. Um, 
And I am going to adjust my uh, settings here. I'm going to move myself up. Uh, I'm going to promote myself a little bit. There we go. Update layout. Hopefully that will have uh, moved me uh, because when I bring up the chats, it's blocking my face. Um, so why don't they use fake guns? There's a million and two real guns out there, and they're a lot easier to um, they're a lot easier to get. Uh, people don't like if you're looking for one specific gun, it's you know a, a difficult thing. Uh, the other thing is that there's a whole bunch of things that you can do with real guns. And yeah, this is a good point. Blanks are terrible for creating filth down the barrel and in the cylinder, but you should be you should be taking care of them, right? You should be this should be there should be maintenance going on. So yeah. Um, do I need some Zora protection? Um, yeah, we can bring Zora in to help out. Um, Zora. <laughs> there we go. We'll bring in the Zora to, to help out. Um, yeah, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'm going to move. Uh, I'm going to take Zora out. And then I'm going to move myself just a bit. To just the perfect spot. There we go. There, that's perfect. All right. Um, so, um, a film with such high-profile actors should have the funding to be able to make fake guns, though. The problem is, is that you need the fake guns thing to... You need the fake guns to actually be real guns, if that makes sense. You've got to be able to fire blanks out of them. You've got to be able to... All of this stuff, and pretty quickly, your fake guns are just real guns. So... Yeah, um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense there. All right, let's uh, let's keep going here and uh, get to. Now, the other thing I want to comment on is um, Hannah Gutierrez. Um, and I know every time I comment on somebody's appearance, people are going to be critical, especially when I comment on the appearance of a woman. But in this case, I think her lawyers and her did a fan freaking tastic job with her because when you see her on the body camera footage the way she looks at the the day of the incident and how i'm betting she looks normally um you know she's got uh you can see that little dimple in her uh in her lip that i think is normally a pierce where a piercing is uh she's normally got like purple and yellow hair um i mean she's normally got a very distinctive kind of look and nothing wrong with that look, except nothing wrong with that look in the real world. The instant you're stepping into a courtroom, there's something wrong with that look. You do not want anybody, anybody uh, to be judging your client based on how they look. You want to look respectful, polite, and freaking boring. You want to look like somebody who nobody would ever take note of if they passed you in a hallway, right? Just, and, you know, this, she looks really good. You know, she, they, they did a really good job with her. She looks professional. She looks respectful. She looks unexceptional. And the other thing, um, she looks young. Uh, and the reason why that's good here is that they want to play up that she is being oppressed and like bullied by this production. They want to. So I think that the look of this is, I think it's good that she looks kind of, kind of young. Right. So I think they did a fantastic job. I hope that I mean, I expect the defense counsel and her had a meeting where they sat down and said, you guys, like, you've got to tone your look down. You've got to, um, you've got to, let's, let's work on how you look. Um, I would have had that meeting with her and I think fantastic, right? Um, I don't, the thing is, is as much as it shouldn't matter, as much as it should never matter what, the person looks like it shouldn't matter if she's sitting there with a forehead tattoo that says murder on it. Um, but it does, especially when you've got a jury, right? That one person in that jury might be, you know, some older man or woman who just like 
hates dyed hair or hates piercings and would look at her as lesser or, you know, or more guilty for that. So fantastic. I got no um, perfect, no notes, like just no notes. I really like what she what she's done there. All right, let's keep going. Uh, they're going to get to talking about blanks and dummies and so forth. Although it looks old, uh, it has, it's not a gun that has had hundreds or thousands of rounds put through it. The reason why this gun looks old is actually that you buy that finish. I bought the same finish because um, it looks cool. Um, it's just you pay money for that finish. That's it. It's just designed to look that way. It was a brand new and perfectly functioning gun when it arrived on the set. Uh, the second thing that the armorer is responsible for is sourcing and purchasing blank and dummy ammunition. So here, this is important because a lot of this, um, a lot of this is going to be about the difference between blank ammunition, dummy ammunition, live ammunition, and a new one replica ammunition and um that is you know this is <clears throat> this is going to be a big important thing and the prosecution has the tougher job um the prosecution um has the um the the more difficult um uh, task here because the prosecution, uh, sorry, I just had to return a, an email real quick with an armor because there's an issue I want to talk about. And, um, I'm going to have to talk about it a little more later. Uh, he and I are going to have a phone conversation tomorrow to discuss it. But, um, so back to, um, back to dummies, blanks, etc. The, um, it's really important that the jury understand the difference. The prosecutor needs to make things crystal freaking clear. That's his job. Prosecutor wins when the jury is like, I understand everything. And now that I understand everything, I think she's guilty. That's the prosecution's dream spot. Defense can win in one of two ways. Defense can win based on, I understand everything and I don't think she did it or I'm not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. But defense has an additional win condition. The additional win condition for the defense is, I have no clue what's going on. Because if the jury at the end of the day says, I don't understand any of this, they can't convict, right? They will get to the end, they'll be like, I, I, I don't know, right? And I have told, like, I, in front of trials with judges, I... I said, like in one of my closings, I was like, listen, I am going to tell you, I don't know if my client did it. I don't know if my client didn't do it, but I'm going to say you don't know either because this file is such a mess that I don't understand. And the judge just at the end of it said, I agree. I don't know what happened here. I have to acquit. So prosecutor has to be clear. Um, and this is another reason why he can be boring a little bit. You're going to be hearing a lot throughout this trial about the differences between live and... Okay, so this, uh, folks, is a blank round. What is a blank round? A blank round is one that when you fire it, it will make a bang. It will make smoke and flares and whatever else, right? Um yeah, and this is it. There was enough chaos that the noise can deliver it for the defense. Absolutely. And good to see you, Eric. Good. So uh, a blank round goes bang. And a blank round is dangerous. People have been killed by blank rounds. If you take a gun and you put it up to the side of the head and you pull the trigger, a blank round will still push your brains into places brains don't go. Um, and when you look at the uh, the shooting on the crow... That was with a blank round, although the issue in that was an obstruction in the barrel. Uh, Brandon Lee was killed by the combination of a blank plus an obstruction into the barrel, which actually was a bullet, right? The obstruction was a bullet, uh, but it could have been something else. It could have been, you know, uh, a dowel or something like that. So um, a blank is 
still dangerous. There is, um, you wouldn't want somebody to hold a gun like three feet from your face and fire it with a blank. That would be extremely dangerous. So you have to be very careful with blanks as well. But why are blanks used? Well, because sometimes when you pull the trigger, you need things to go bang. Um, sometimes when you pull the trigger, you need things to make a flash of light. If you've ever watched the movie Equilibrium, there are some fantastic fight scenes in it that take place in like a darkened space where as they fire the guns, it's illuminating the room and you can see things when the guns are fired, but not otherwise. That's all done with blanks. So, um, yeah, you can also often catch blanks in movies. And what I mean by that is that you'll see things where they'll pull the trigger and you'll see the round eject and you can see that characteristic crimping on, um, on the ejected brass. In some cases, they've really effed this up. If you watch the trailers for the movie Hitman, which was not a great movie. I love the Hitman games. I had high hopes for it, but the Hitman movie was meh. But in the trailer, they fire the gun and then it zooms in and slow-mos the brass falling and you can see the crimp. Um, I would love to see a movie that did that um, well, where the crimping was actually a plot point. I have not seen that yet. Um, so yeah, this is... This is where this goes. Whenever you see a gun fired in a movie and there's a bang, we're talking a blank. Um, they never should be using live ammo on a film like this. Ammunition, blank ammunition, dummy ammunition. So I'm just going to kind of give you a 10,000 foot overview of, of what this stuff is. The there was, he was screwing around on set. It's what's called a blank round. A blank round is actually pretty easy to distinguish because it has that crimped end where, uh, where normally a bullet would be. Uh, I'm just going to say, somebody said I'd never seen a crimped bullet. Um, so I bought, um, a, I bought it was, I think it was 500 rounds of nine mil. And the guy sent me 500 blanks for nine mil. So I've got 500 nine mil blanks. Um, I don't have any use for them, but um, yeah. The reason that blanks are used in the movie is because when it's in the gun and an actor pulls a trigger, uh, there is enough gunpowder inside of that blank to cause a pop and have a, a cloud of smoke come out from the gun, but it doesn't have a projectile that shoots through the barrel of the gun. So these are a type of uh, round that is used frequently on the movie sets especially whenever they want to make uh, make it look like the actor is actually firing a weapon. Now, this is another problem with how we name, like, ammunition. Because, really, ammunition, we, we should be saying cartridge, not, not bullet. Because the bullet actually only refers to one specific part of the cartridge. Like, here is a dummy cartridge. And the bullet is the lead part. That's the bullet. Uh, whereas the cartridge is the whole package. This is the cartridge or the round. Um, but yeah. And somebody in the chat was asking, why don't they use foam or plastic bullets? Um, and the reason why they don't is because they shouldn't be firing anything. Um, firing a bit of foam is worse than firing nothing. And that's what they're uh, supposed to be. Yeah, I mean, his opening didn't bomb. He didn't screw anything up, but his opening was boring. And he really needed, I mean, it would have been better to have a little bit more life to it. Hopefully at the end of, hopefully at the end of the day, his opening is just the beginning of things and they can lay things out through the story. Um, I hope that they'll do a better job on the close. Um because if the close is this bad, like, or not bad, but if the close is boring and doesn't tell a story, they're, they're in, you know, at the end of the day, when they get to the close, they should get to something riveting. And I suspect they're going to have the, uh, the female prosecutor do the close. That's my bet. So, yeah. 
The second type of round that is used on the sets are what's called dummy rounds. And these are a little bit, these are a different story. Dummies look. So I just want you guys to take note of the dummies that are on the right hand side. Cause you see that there's one here with a hole drilled in the side. And there's another one here with a BB in it. Now the film armors I talked to prefer for there to be, you know, people were saying that they want to have at least two signs that it's a, um, that it's a dummy, but that really wasn't what we were seeing here. So um, we're going to talk about just how much the dummies in this case are a mess. Exactly like real bullets. As you can tell from kind of that main image there, although this uh, evidence dummy round has some writing on it, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that from a live bullet if you were just looking at it with your eyes. Uh, and because these dummy rounds are designed to look exactly like live ammunition, <clears throat> every round... That was a mistake. That was a mistake, and he shouldn't have said it. What he should have said is that these bullets are designed to look enough like live ammunition to pass on film, but to also make it clear when handling it that they are dummies. Um, that was a mistake. Um, that was a big unforced error that we just saw right there because one of Hannah's defenses is going to be, how can I tell the difference? Sloppy language in a place that it should not have been sloppy. Um, minus 10 points. Has to be thoroughly checked before it is put inside of one of these firearms. This, however, is true. Um, aside from sourcing firearms, blanks, and dummies for the movie, uh, the next major function that Hannah was required... Now, I'm just going to say, often the sourcing of dummies is you make them yourself. Um, I have shown that, you know, I've got some 45 long Colt film dummies. I source these from Movie Armaments Group, and I think Movie Armaments Group makes these themselves, I think. I'm not certain, but um, yeah. Um, it's not hard to make these. I mean, I don't actually have a, um, I don't have the equipment, but I could go buy the equipment that you'd need for a couple hundred bucks. And I could knock out dummies all day on that. So, I mean, it's just not, not hard. To do on the movie set is that she was required. Because to CGI looks really, really bad. Uh, to make sure that it's a, the appropriate blank or dummy and not live ammunition before it gets inserted into the gun. And there are... This is also a place where Hannah is having trouble because Hannah is... Um, Hannah is bored. And there's several places where she gets bored because they're telling the jury things that Hannah knows, you know, about like how live ammo works and so forth. And she has trouble... Um, you know, has trouble dealing with all that. Um, do I reload my own ammo? No. Um, I just don't have the time. Uh, Smoke Jaguar 6 says, I still don't believe this was an accident. I think someone put live rounds in on purpose. I think that the prosecution today did a very good job of um, uh, of putting an end to that. I think that that is not really a viable theory after this, but I could be wrong. Two primary ways... Uh, that an armorer or anybody who's familiar with this can check to make sure that a, a round is a dummy round. The first thing they can do is shake it. And if you'll see in that, uh, on the lower right-hand side, we I've got a photograph for you there of a plastic container that's got three BBs in it. Um, those BBs are inside hear that. of that That's dummy round. That's me shaking a dummy round. So that whenever you shake it, you can audibly hear that it's making a noise. And that way you know it's a dummy round. Sometimes they have shake a little like spring a in there pick. rather than these bullets. <laughs> but they always have some sort of noise maker in there. Uh, the other way to distinguish a dummy from a real live bullet is in that top right photograph. And you'll see that that, uh, that cartridge has a hole drilled into the side of the casing. That's the second way that you can distinguish a dummy round from a live round. 
And then we have, not to overcomplicate things, but I think it's important that you know this. Not to overcomplicate things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is, you know, key. Reenactors um, should know how not or not to aim at others. You aim over their shoulder in a shootout situation. Most gunfights on film are done one at a time for those close-up shots. Yeah, if you ever see the gunfighting scene where they're like, you know, they, they're right up close and then you see the guy draw and fire, he's firing in an empty room. They'll have the other guy film the draw and, oh, I got hit. And that guy's also in an empty room because they can film them both at the separate times and then just make it look like they're standing across from each other. Um, and when they're actually right up, like when you see them both in the frame, they're drawing and firing beside the other guy. Like they do that with framing and so forth. So all of this makes it uh, possible so that you can, yeah. Yeah, I think Hannah's trying to keep a neutral face, but isn't sure how it can be tiring. I think she does a really good job with this overall because it's very hard not to be caught on camera making some kind of face or some kind of anything, right? Because you're, you're here for... She's going to be here for eight hours a day for like two weeks, right? It's going to be really, really hard to do this. And um, so it's going to be tough. And um, there's only a couple of moments where I sort of caught her like playing in her chair or something like that. Um, it's going to be tough for her. All right, let's... Uh, we also have some dummy rounds that are missing what's called the primer. Uh, normally on a, on a live cartridge, there's a, an, ex, uh, an explosive element that is inside of that center portion that whenever the hammer of the gun hits that primer, it causes a small spark that then ignites the rest of the gunpowder in the bullet and causes the, uh, the projectile to be expelled. I'm going to say, um, if you know guns, running gun files is incredibly tiresome at certain parts. Because, like, when I'm running a trial on a gun issue, I have to explain how guns work. And he's having to explain how guns work here. It's got to be done. Now, if you don't know how guns work, a lot of this can be interesting and fascinating and so forth. But when you, when you do know, this kind of feels like... Um, explaining how, like, how you put on your seatbelt in incredible detail. Um, like, this is, yeah, and Elf Ligon says, how is this not counsel testifying? This isn't evidence. None of this is evidence. This is the opening statement. And so later, they're going to have to reemphasize this through experts and so forth. But right now, this is just, um, just that. So, um, Smoke Jaguar 6, we'll get there because this scene was a mess. Um, so. So dummy rounds, as you can see, as you can see, uh, they do look an awful lot like live ammunition, but there are ways, if you are careful, that you can distinguish a, uh, a dummy round from a live round. Now, you don't have to be that careful. And one of the things that they really... Uh, they really set things up to be, um, we really set, they really set things up to be a disaster on this set, as we'll hear, by, and this just boggles my mind, they had so many different kinds of dummy rounds. Uh, to me, if I'm thinking we're on a set and I need 300 dummy rounds, I want every 300 dummy round, like all 300 of those to be exactly the same. I want them all to be distinguishable or if I need to use different types, like maybe sometimes there's a close up shot where I can't have a punched out primer and I need it to be something else, um, you know, because you can see the punched out primer in this. Um, maybe if you need to have two types, you only have two types, you know, and you only use the other type for the specific circumstances. She's, Everything that what we'll hear in today's thing is that everything is a mess. There are multiple different types of blanks and they were scattered all over the place. They were lying on the floor of her truck. They were 
out of their bins. They were everywhere. You can't be careless and sloppy and messy with this. This this calls for somebody who is absolutely anal and, you know, yeah. They had problems sourcing dummies, had to reach out to their props people. I can tell you, if I was the armor on this, I would have been sitting there and either synchronizing up the like the uh, the dummies or I would have been making my own. Um, and I know that she didn't have enough time to do everything, but um, like just make sure you get it done. Make sure you. Yeah, I I would have I would have been sitting there, you know, assembling my own brass because um, you spend you spend a weekend doing it. You knock out 500 of them. You're good. The next yeah, multiple kinds of dummies of the armor. There also be multiple kinds of blanks, by the way. Check the firearm before it is brought on to the set. Um, and there's a very specific process that is used for this. Uh, when it's time for a firearm to be used, the armorer is required to present the firearm to the first assistant director to double check that only dummy rounds uh, are inside the gun. Now, what you're hearing what you should be hearing out of this is that they are going to have an expert to testify about how this works. They're going to have a film armor to throw Hannah all the way under the bus. And that is really where she belongs on this one. And the armor is also supposed to offer the actor who is receiving the gun, the opportunity to also have the gun inspected in front of them. <clears throat> now this is this moment right here, that moment is fan freaking tastic for Baldwin. Um, I posted on Twitter. I said the big winner of this is Baldwin in today's thing, because really it should be that the actor is shown that the gun is, is cleared here. He's saying the opportunity to be shown. And I'm like, yeah, it should be that you always get shown. Um, but I mean, based on this, this that's fantastic evidence for Baldwin. I want that moment. Um, I want that moment to come out. Like if I'm Baldwin, I want that moment to be repeated and you can't use this trial in Baldwin's trial, but I want to find out that, you know, which expert is going to say that. And I want to bring them in. Right. I I'm subpoenaing that person to be like, Hey, um, yeah. So that I think is a, a great thing for Baldwin on that, that, you know, he had the opportunity to check, but they're saying, okay, well, it's not a big deal if they um, if they don't. Um, so let's skip ahead a little bit. There's a moment I wanted to cover. It's not that far off, but scenes without any particular incidents occurring. Um, leading up to the lunch hour, a small group of cast and crew were inside uh, the church, working on getting some close-up shots of Alec Baldwin sitting on a church pew. Uh, and manipulating his uh, revolver. That scene was completed just before lunch. And so they called for a lunch break up to 1.25. Uh, and let me back up just a little bit uh, before. Guys, this guy's not getting more interesting. I just put him at 25% faster, just so you know. The lunch break was called. I, I want you all to see what was going on. Uh, this is. So this is clearly not video of Baldwin. This is some sort of AI reproduction or whatever. Now, one thing I want you to know here is that uh, Baldwin is doing what they call a cross draw. And so a cross draw here, let me try to sit up so I can show it to you. Cross draws, you've got the revolver on one side and you're reaching across with the, um, you know, with your other, um, your other hand and your, drawing across like that. Now, I just want you to think when you do that, there's this huge swing of the gun, right? This big swing. I, in doing this, right, I am now flagging a giant arc of the room. Cross drawing is, you know, a lot more risky than what you do like normally, like normal draw would be, I reach down, and I up, right? 
And so, you know, you draw and like if you're doing a full draw present or you might draw shoot, um, you know, depending on sort of like a Western, you might draw fire from close to the hip because, you know, it's it's quick draw. Um, so cross draw is not permitted in a lot of different competition shooting because of the risk that you will, you know, that you screw up and you fire at some point in this arc. Um, cross draw is risky. And they're saying, why aren't they using real pictures when they have the footage? Because the camera person is not in the real picture, right? Uh, the real picture is from the perspective of the camera person. They need to use some fake in order to put the camera person in there. So, yeah. Um, so that gives you an idea of what was going on that morning. Uh, Alec Baldwin. What's the point of cross draw? Some people prefer it. Uh, the other thing is uh, this revolver is um, this revolver is slow to reload. So if you're thinking of like cowboys, uh, you would have uh, your you've got a six you got six shots, but it reloads through a loading gate. So if you've ever seen where the cylinder swings out, the cylinder does not swing out on this gun. It you open a little gate, it exposes one one chamber each time and you have to like reload it one chamber at a time that's slow so why do you end up cross drawing well sometimes it was i have my primary gun that's on one side and you pull it up and you shoot and when that goes empty because also you'd only load five you would not typically in this era load six you would fire five Toss gun reload. That gives you another five shots. Um, cross draw is not fantastic. The other thing is a gun is heavy. You know, you might be more comfortable with it on one side or the other. Um, there's all sorts of reasons. I'm sitting on a church pew and he was practicing this draw from his holster uh, with the camera crew kind of close up on top of him. So they completed that scene and they called for uh, the lunch hour to occur. Um, so during the lunch hour, Ms. Gutierrez took the gun from Mr. Baldwin and she uh, took it back to the site, to the safe. The gun. Now somebody says, why do they only load five? Because the old guns were not what they call drop safe. Um, and so the old guns didn't have a lot of the safety features that are in the gun now. The gun Baldwin is using is not an old gun. It's not an antique. It's a modern recreation of an old gun. So they've added all these safety features. But the old ones, uh, if you like brushed up against a twig or something, or you know you s accidentally smacked the gun, um, it could go off. And so the reason why you'd load five is so that the hammer could be resting on an empty chamber. The hat like there's six, but the hammer is resting on nothing. So that way, if it gets flicked, it can't set it off because it's on nothing. The other thing is that if you, like, when you've got five loaded, when you pull the gun out, if you pull the hammer all the way back, now it rotates the cylinder, and now you're on a live cartridge. So you load five in order to keep it on an empty cylinder while you're, like, an empty chamber while you're moving around, but still have it ready for business. The way you do that, um, and that's because it's a six shooter, right? That's six in the uh, in the you know in the cylinder. The way you do that is you load one, skip one, and then you load four. And if you've done that, like if you do that, then you will be with five loaded on an empty chamber when you're done. So now you have learned a little bit about how to load load an old timey revolver unsafe that was loaded on a prop cart. Um, once lunch was over, the production decided that they wanted to continue working inside of the church. Um, but at this point, they weren't actually filming anything like they were in this video that I just showed you. And instead, they were doing what's called a blocking. And that is, in film terms, what you do before you even get to a rehearsal. So it's like a very rough rehearsal where the lighting director, the camera operator, and all of the folks are trying to get things situated so that they can then move into a rehearsal. 
whenever a blocking is going on because they aren't filming, uh, there's really no need for the actor to have a live uh, firearm in their hands or even for the live firearm to be, yet be on set. It's funny because some of the armorers I talked to noted that they uh, they said, like a lot of them said things like, when we're blocking, uh, we don't have a live gun. Uh, and they've used things like, here's a banana. Here is a piece of wood. Here is, you know, uh, here's a sandwich. One of them said that they actually did blocking with a sandwich because it was just like, you only need to be showing that you're holding something. And it's like, yeah. Um, um, you're going to hear from several witnesses or from one witness in particular uh, who's going to testify that for purposes of blocking, uh, Mr. Baldwin could have been using a stick, a rubber gun, uh, anything that would essentially allow him to mimic a gun. It didn't have to be a live firearm. Um, on that day, though, the defendant was asked to provide Mr. Baldwin with a live firearm for the blocking, uh, and she did, and, and that was within her discretion to do so. Um, you're going to hear that on the day of the shooting, Ms. Gutierrez loaded the gun in the morning with five rounds. Uh, the revolver, though, is a six-shooter, so it can hold six rounds, but in that morning, she only was able to load five of them. Uh, after now, this is this is the part I was wanting to get to is, you know, she was only able to load five of them. Well, five is the correct number. They are filming a Western, right? They're filming a um, they're, so they should be doing period appropriate loads, which would have been five. I don't I don't get why she's loading six. Um, the lunch break was over. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez retrieved the gun from the safe and she cleaned that sixth hole and was able to put a sixth round into the sixth slot. Ms. Gutierrez then took the firearm to the church and handed the gun over to the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls. Ms. Gutierrez, Ms. Gutierrez and Mr. Halls then did a sloppy and incomplete safety check of the gun where the dummy rounds were not removed from the gun and rattled or checked to see if they had a hole drilled in it. Instead, she just kind of cracked open the gun and partially sp spun the cylinder. To okay, so this is making it sound like they're using a um, a swing out cylinder, which is not what they're using in this. Like this is not what this thing is. They open the loading gate, um, and the loading gate just gives you a, a little a little window there to that lets you see one uh one round at a time why do you say the period load would be five rounds would you not put in six to have more rounds available i i explained that you load five and the reason why is that you want um you want the hammer to be resting on an empty uh empty chamber um her job wasn't historical accuracy that would have been script supervisor or historical consultant on a good set yeah um I mean, if I was the armor, I would still be like, hey, you're filming a cowboy movie. You sure you want six? I think you want five. So. Show Mr. Hall's a few of the rounds, but they were not removed from the gun and they weren't all checked. Now, somebody's asking, this isn't evidence, right? This is not evidence. Nobody's testified at all yet. And so this is stuff they're going to have to back up. But this is basically an expectation of what their evidence is going to look like. So um, I thought this was a little bit weird that he's like saying basically that the gun opens like this because it doesn't seem like it made it sound like it's got a swing open cylinder. And I don't know about that. So. Yeah, if he knew that he was going into a gunfight, why? Oh, come on. Of course, Ian, but you and I have for, <laughs> forgotten more about guns than Hannah knew yet. Yeah, that's fair. Um, oh, come on. Because of the ranch's remote location, it took some time before additional medical per personnel arrived. Um, All right, let's back. Much more complete check. So having failed to do that check herself, she then handed the firearm to Mr. Halls anyway. She exited so the now church. We and are Mr. Halls handed the firearm to Mr. We were about half an hour into his um into his open, and he's just now started to explain what actually happened. 
Um, and this, I think, is um, this, I think, is a little bit of a problem. Like, uh, this is not ideal. You want to you want to tell a story. You want to explain what's going on. You don't want to give the jury time to tune out before they know what your actual theory is. So, yeah. Mr. Baldwin, as the blocking session was underway, Mr. Hutchins and uh, excuse me, Miss Hutchins and several of her crewmates were busily working, looking through and adjusting cameras. Uh, and Mr. Baldwin was sitting on that church pew, uh, practicing how he would hold the gun for the upcoming filming session. Um, as Mr. Baldwin was manipulating the firearm, uh, it, he caused it to discharge, and that unfortunately sent a projectile knowledge uh, isn't flying in, directly isn't at Ms. transmissible Ms. that way. Uh, the projectile shot completely through Miss Hutchins, and then struck the film's director Joel Souza in the shoulder. So at this point, the set paramedic was called into the church and began life-saving efforts on both Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza. Another crew member who was in the church called 911 to report the shooting and to seek additional medical assistance. But because of the ranch's remote location, it took some Picking time before additional medical per personnel arrived. Time and a half. Um, and, and this additional support also included a, a life flight helicopter for Ms. Hutchins. Like, guy... You're talking about a death here. Uh, death is inherently, I, I'm going to use a term that people are going to, somebody in the chat is going to be offended by. Uh, death is inherently sexy. And what I mean by that is not like somebody in the room is getting, you know, aroused or anything like that. I mean that it's not hard to make death exciting. Um, you know, and this guy is making it boring, right? <laughs> it's like, you're talking about something that is inherently sympathetic, that is inherently interesting, that is inherently, um, you know, fascinating. Don't read it like it's a phone booth, like you're reading out of the phone book, right? Like it's, put some drama on it. This is a moment when people were sitting there running around going, oh my God, people are dying and what what do we have like yeah and yeah according to her instagram thel reed didn't teach her anything she's entirely self-taught um yeah which so this should be this should this part should be read in a dramatic um dramatic way um a team of medical personnel worked to stabilize her uh, and they placed her on the life flight to UNMH. Um, but sadly, the personnel at UNMH were unable to overcome the injuries that she sustained, uh, and she was pronounced deceased at UNMH. We will show you. She was pronounced deceased. Sir, this is your opening. You know, you can say she died. You can say that before she, like, that she had, that she bled to death, that she died because the bullet had done traumatic damage to her organs. Like, tell the jury something more than she was pronounced dead. Um, yeah, magazines, not clips. Clips are common with rifles. Not even that common. Um, there's a few that use them, they're not super common. Um, semi-automatic modern firearms use mags. Yep. Um, I mean, clips still exist, but they're not super common. All right, let's skip ahead a little bit because otherwise we're going to die of this. All right. Play. Rounds were on set on the 10th and the, the other bullet, the other, uh, dummy rounds didn't arrive until the 12th. We also have a little bit more evidence that these live rounds came onto the set via the defendant when she came to New Mexico from out of state. So this is the prosecution's theory of how the live rounds get on set. Everyone wants to know. Um, everyone wants to know how these rounds get on set. And prosecution's theory is Hannah did it. Now, I don't think they need to prove Hannah did it to, to get to a conviction. I think that they can get to a conviction with Hannah should have spotted them. Like, some people have said, oh, what if there's a saboteur who mixed live rounds in? Well, um, she loaded the rounds. She should have spotted it. Um, that, yeah. 
Um, as you can see from this photo, this is the box of rounds. This is kind of a blown up photograph of the box of rounds that she was pulling from on the day of the shooting. And you can see that it has a very specific label on it that says 45 long Colt dummies. And then in much smaller print there in the middle, you can see the initials JS. So on November 9th, uh, a couple of weeks after the shooting, the defendant came into the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office uh, for an interview with Corporal Hancock, and she was asked questions about the box of ammunition she was pulling from the day of the uh, incident, this box with the small JS on the label. Uh, the defendant told Corporal Hancock that, the, that she thought this box was kind of peculiar and she wasn't certain where it came from, but she said that she didn't believe it was one of the uh, boxes that was originally brought on set. But then the defendant offered to Corporal Hancock that the day prior to the interview, she had asked her father back home uh, to text her a photograph of the box of 45 long Colt dummies that they had at his home. And she texted him uh, and he texted her this photo in response. It's identical. It's the same box. The box of dummies she was pulling from on the 21st is identical to the box of dummies that her father had at home. So we believe this is more evidence that this box of dummies with the live round in it came from the defendant. Did you catch that, folks? Um, this is going to be big. I theorized on um, Eric Hunley, who's been in the chat here. He's got a Friday night show or a Friday afternoon or noon show. Um, it's a good show. You should watch it. On one day, we were discussing the Rust trial, and I theorized the possibility that the live ammo was came from Thel Reed. And that one of the reasons why Hannah was unwilling to talk about where the ammo came from was that it could have been from Thel Reed. What's the prosecution's theory? That it could have been from Thel Reed. And Thel Reed could have given her the ammo and then she could have brought that on set. Or that she got it from the set or from Thel Reed's house. And then this is huge for two reasons. This is a bombshell moment and nobody seems to have caught it. I I went and looked at a bunch of people streaming over this moment and I don't think anyone caught this. Um, Thel Reed is a famous, famous figure in the armor community. Huge. Thel Reed has been an armor on a ton of Westerns. He is, um, you know, he is like the guy. Now, Thel Reed is towards retirement at this point. He's sort of out of the game. He's, you know, kind of handing things off uh, towards uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. But this is um, this is a huge, huge allegation. And Thel Reed is on her witness list. Hannah Gutierrez wants to call Thel Reed. And so if Thel Reed gets called to the stand to talk about this, they can suggest to him, uh, they can be and be like, this, this came from you, didn't it? And she never checked it, did she? Um, yeah. And this uh, comment here is, um, no, he's the reason why she puts Reed in her name. Yeah, her name is actually... Hannah Gutierrez. It's not Hannah Gutierrez Reed. She says Hannah Gutierrez Reed because she wants to be associated with this guy. This is an incredible moment. Incredible moment in this trial. Um, and, and it's just this quiet little moment that is there. Um, yeah. We're also going to show you how these live rounds slowly spread their way throughout the set eventually landing in several of the actors' costumes and firearms on October 13th, 15th, 17th, and of course on the 21st. And the image on your screen. Yeah, and Eric is saying the plan is for Thel to finger Seth. Yep, but I think they're going to, I think it's going to be interesting to see how he holds up on cross because he's going to end up getting cross-examined on that and um, it'll be uh, it'll be an interesting mess overall. So I want to see sort of how that... Um, how that comes about. Right now, you can see uh, in the, the large photograph, that's the bandolier that Mr. Baldwin was wearing on the 21st. There is a live round inside of that bandolier. The so this is a another big moment in the, um, you know, in this, because here's the bandolier Eric, her, her Alec Baldwin was wearing 
during the filming, there's a live round right there. And that is like, that's a big thing, right? Um, who would have been putting these rounds into the bandoliers? Well, that also would have been Hannah. And yeah. Um, so Urfe says, in this picture, show me the live round. None are fired. So I will tell you which one is the live round. The live round is the one that is second. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse here. Uh, can you guys see the mouse wiggling? This one here is the live round. That one is the live round. Um, and there are five good primers. The way you would tell is you actually have to pull the round out and check it, right? You have to you have to check it. So, um, yeah, it, this wasn't being checked here, and that's that's a problem. All right, let us skip ahead, and then we will be done with this guy. And I know you'll miss him terribly, but um, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Several of the crew members who were inside the church on the day of this horrific incident. We're confident that after you hear from these witnesses and after you have an opportunity to look at the evidence for yourself in greater detail, you will agree with us that the defendant's actions were not only negligent on October 21st, but on many days leading up to the 21st. Uh, we hope that after you review this information, uh, you will find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And after reviewing and hearing from the witness concerning the tampering charge, uh, we believe that you will also uh, convict her on the tampering with evidence charge as well. I'm about done, but I do want to leave you with one final statement. And this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. Um, first of all, we just paused this. And did you see her face? Did you see her face do the oh shit? <laughs> did you see her do the oh shit face? Um, yeah, let's, uh, I think we can go back five seconds. Watch Hannah Gutierrez's face here. And this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. She said that real brief. Oh, shit. Um, Hannah should never have given the interviews that she gave. Um, her lawyer should have been like, oh, my God, do not do not. Um, Hannah's biggest problem is the statements that she made, the uh, the interviews that she gave. And here they are going to just throw that in her face and they're going to throw it in her face repeatedly through this trial. If she gets up to cross examine, they are going to keep throwing it in her face. Um, so, yeah. As at the end, I just I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. Thank you. That is a good end. I like the ending. I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. Done. Mic drop. Now, the thing is, is it sounds better at one and a half speed because this guy has the slowest delivery, um, the slowest delivery. And this is another issue. Um, her demeanor during the interrogation was so nonchalant. Yeah, her her demeanor was bad. Um, her demeanor was um, her demeanor was sloppy. Uh, like it, it she doesn't come off like somebody who cares about all of this. And that's a real problem. So that is the prosecutor. That is their, um, that is their opening. And now um, somebody said, I thought that was normal speed. No, that's one and a half. He just sounds like that when. Uh... <laughs> so now we are going to skip ahead. They have a lunch break. Um, not really a lunch break, but they have a break. Um, and now we're going to skip ahead to um, where they start up. I like this judge, by the way. This judge is actually pretty badass. And yeah, this is the uh, the thing. Most armorers would not permit props master to touch any guns or ammo. I have bandoliers with glued in dummies for props to use. Only uh, me and mine touch the rest. The other thing I've seen, uh, one armor sent me a picture of the bandoliers he uses. And the um, from the back of it, you could actually see they had drilled holes uh, that were through the back of the bandolier because you can't see the bandolier like the back of the bandolier when it's being worn, right? Um, you couldn't see uh, these holes that were drilled, but he'd actually sewn in. He drilled a hole, like two holes into each round and then drilled into the uh, through the leather and sewn every single bullet in such that you couldn't pull them out. Um, 
So, yeah, it. There's no reason to have ammo that you can move into and out of a bandolier. Just fill it with ammo and then leave it. Um, so, uh, where was a good defense was full of it, but much stronger. I thought the defense painted a very good picture um, of what's happening, but I think that the defense's argument ultimately should, and I say should, but that doesn't mean will, should convict her. And what I mean by that is that they should, um, that what the defense's position is basically is that she was negligent, but they're, they're playing a bit of a shell game on it and sort of pushing responsibility to other people. But ultimately the responsibility, um, belongs to her. Um, there's a scene, John Wayne in a Western is loading his rifle from his belt loops. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, you know, in that case, I might like, okay, you're going to load these four. We're going to cut those threads and you can load those four. The rest of them stay in. And then afterwards we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to just fix it together. So, yeah. All right. All right. Once again, they're zoomed right in on Hannah. Somebody says, what would your defense be? I don't know. She's got a really tough spot. I mean, I would say that I would be arguing like I'd, I'd probably be running the same arguments they are, but it's really a jury sympathy argument. So, um, yeah. No, but she should have. Yeah, defense can just muddy the water. Um, I think it's up to 18 months on this, but she's also got an evidence tampering charge that is, um, I think goes up to like three years. She might get more on the evidence tampering than the actual Maybe death. Um, this one I want to address, oh. don't wear the bullet necklace. Um, now I've lost her. Where is she? Uh Guys, this is not a bullet necklace. I, I've seen this. I saw this on Twitter. I saw people commenting on it. Um, it's not a bullet necklace. This is, um, it's a stone of some variety, like a little jade stone um, worn as a pendant. Like it's not, this is not a bullet necklace because I can tell you, um, yeah, it looks like a crystal. Um, if it was a bullet necklace and I was defense counsel, um, I would metaphorically try to slap the stupid out of her and I would tell her, you're taking that out, like take that off right freaking now. And that lives in my pocket for the rest of the day. You can have it back when you're going home, but you don't get to wear that in court. If it was a bullet necklace, it's, it's just a stone, right? It's, it's just fine. So Yeah. And this is the problem. To the jurors, it could look like a bullet if they're far enough away. Um, I saw somebody say, wear a big crucifix. That might be taken as gauche by the jurors. I mean, I would probably, you know, either not wear a necklace or, you know, but I don't have a problem with this one. This one is not a big, you know, um, I don't think it looks, I think the jury's going to see that it's not a bullet necklace. Um, but, um, Maybe wear like a gold something or, you know, something like that. Um, no, I mean, you can have it back and put it in your pocket when you're going home. You may be seated. Yeah, you can see it's very clearly a crystal. Mr. Bowles? 
Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. I got to say, um, I really like his approach. Um, and what I mean by that is when he walks up to the stand, uh, walks up to the podium rather to, to uh, you know, give his opening. He is smooth at starting his opening because, you know, there's almost always a, a thing where people get up and they set up and they take a lot of time and they fumble. This guy is organized. He goes up, he sets down his water, moves over a step, sets down one notebook, moves over another step, sets down another notebook, and then immediately is just like, let us begin. And he's got a great voice. Um, I could listen to this guy all day. He's got a better voice than I do. He, you know, he is a really smooth talker. <laughs> See, uh, smooth, like his head. Yeah, I just... I liked how he walks up and just delivers, right? Like this is, um, I'm not great at this, right? I'm not fantastic at the walk up and deliver, but I like, I was expecting this guy to take a while and he's just like, oh yeah, let's get going. You know, and I think that was, um, I think that's fantastic. This guy also does a much better store, like much better on, telling us a story um he is going to spin a tale of hannah gutierrez's innocence and he's doing a, a better job on that we are privileged our team to represent hannah gutierrez reed you're sitting over here and this is the other thing i like um defense lawyers sometimes do this thing where they're like I want to apologize, like where they sound apologetic for representing their client. Um, we saw that with, um, uh, what's her name? The, um, the mom of the school shooter there, um, where she was like, she sounded like she was apologizing for representing her client. He's like, we are proud to represent Hannah Gutierrez Reed. It's like, fuck yes. Own it. Um, own it. Fantastic. Uh, and this, th this one I wanted to note, I wear a cross every day around my neck. That won't change just because someone may be offended. They almost certainly won't be offended because it's a cross. They may be uh, offended because they think it's a ploy. And the people who will be offended are not non-religious people. The people who will be offended are like the little old church lady who is pissed off that she's like, how dare they wear a cross and, you know, while they're on trial, that's who gets offended by the, uh, the cross necklace. So yeah. Uh, crumbly. Yeah. Her lawyer was, um, a lot of the time was sounding like, I'm sorry. I'm representing this, you know, this woman. It's like, no, we're here because of a tragedy. There's no doubt there was a tragic occurrence on that movie set but let me tell you something you already know just because there was a tragedy does not mean that a crime was committed it does not mean that hannah gutierrez reed caused the crimes they have charged her with and we are going to through the course of this case show you that production and the state have both very early on sought to make hannah gutierrez reed a scapegoat that's what this is about. You're going to hear that this tragedy, several unconnected events, independent events had to happen to create it. First, the first event that had to happen is the actor, Alec Baldwin, pointed a gun on that set, and he either had his finger on the trigger and the hammer cocked, or he pulled the trigger. As he was pointing that at Miss Hutchins, and Mr. Souza, who was right behind her. Okay. Now, um, I really like the thing about a tragedy. Like, this is a tragedy, but just because it's a tragedy doesn't mean it's a crime. Great line. Great opening. Fantastic. This, on the other hand, is true. You know, and he's pointing the finger at Baldwin, saying it's Baldwin's fault, partially. It's a good thing to bring up. It's also bullshit. Because... Part of Hannah's job is to make sure that even if the actor does something stupid, 
the actors shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be killing anybody. Had Hannah done her job, Baldwin's fuck up, Baldwin's stupid action would not have mattered here. And that's the thing is you can say there's a whole bunch of different safety failures that had to happen. And she's on charge for the one that she did. And that's that's the problem, right? So that's the issue. But we've got a jury and the jury might be sympathetic. So the jury might be going, you know what? We'll cut her a pass. Um, lots of other people screwed up. Sure, she screwed up too, but you know, lots of other people did. The thing is, she has a special responsibility on this set. She's the armorer. There's two real people with critical responsibility as to what happens with this gun, and those are the armorer and the person holding it. And so, yes, Baldwin screwed up, but that doesn't take away her screw-up. So, let's keep going. And make no mistake, this is not a prop gun. This is a real gun. Yes. Mr. Baldwin pointed it right at him, either had his finger on the trigger and depressed, or pulled it causing that gun to fire and hit Miss Hutchins. That's the first thing that had to happen. Miss Gutierrez-Reed, you're not going to hear anything about her being in that church or firing that weapon. That was Alec Baldwin. Now, this guy also has a slow delivery, right? He's also got a really slow cadence. and But he manages to put some emotion behind it, right? He manages to put some feeling to it. And so he's a lot more listenable. Um. You will hear that Hollywood actors are not allowed to point guns, real guns, at other actors or crew. It's, a, it's like every other uh, safety with guns in any other place in society. You learn these rules and go into the classes. You learn these rules if you've ever owned a gun. Rule number one, never point a firearm at somebody unless you intend to shoot them. And that rule was broken. And that's going to be the first thing you're going to hear that, that caused this tragic accident. The second thing is that Hannah is being made a scapegoat for are deliberate errors and mistakes by production. Here's the thing. She's like, she's going to be pointing the finger at production, right? And this guy's doing a good job in this open. Like this is, this is good. Um, pointing the finger at production. Whose job is it? We're not still at 1.5. I slowed it down to one, like one to one. Um, the thing is, is that um, if production is pushing her to do too many things or pushing her to whatever else, um, then that is like, that's also on her because the armorer's job isn't just to, um, isn't just to like make sure everything's safe. It's also, if you are in a position where you can't make everything safe, your job is to be the safety valve because your job is to say, F you, I'm leaving. And the guns are leaving too. This is not getting filmed like this because it is your job to be the safety person, right? Um, you, and if she leaves, the guns leave with her so it's not like i've seen some people say oh if she'd left they would have like still done this no if they let if she'd left they're sitting there on a film set to film a western with no guns which um is not going to go very far if the armor puts their foot down and when i like i've called a bunch of armorers and, you know, if there's other armors out there who want to call and give me crap, I'm happy to talk to you and get your take on it. But um, ultimately, the what armors told me is that they they all had stories of putting their foot down. And they were all proud of those stories. One armor told me essentially that he got a guy, um, his character changed from a gunslinger, like a guy with a gun, to a guy who throws knives. And the reason why was, sorry, this guy can't be stopped from messing around with the guns, so he doesn't get one. Um, like, he doesn't get a, a gun because he doesn't, um, you know, 
He's just not allowed to do that. Um, you know, he can't be trusted not to, uh, you know, not to mess around with it. So therefore he doesn't get one. If you like, people are saying, oh, she's, you know, she's young. She's new in her career. She's inexperienced. Well, let me tell you, um, this is the end of her career, right? So if you're saying, oh, well, um, you know, she's got to look out for her career. This is the end of her career. But the whole point of the job is you need to, you know, if they don't, you know, if they push you around because of your age, you walk. And if you can't do that, if you can't walk off set, like with the guns, because that's necessary for safety, you should not be an armorer. That is the most important job of an armorer is to be able to go, fuck it, I'm out. Um, fuck it, I'm out. And yeah, um, KVB Studios going, who's done like film armorer work for, that's why I'm bringing these up. Uh, I got a grip fired. A grip is sort of a, a helper monkey on set. Like it is kind of the lowest rank uh, you can have on a film set, which is where you're running around assisting with various tasks uh, fired for, uh, for carrying for EDC everyday carry on set and refusing to remove the gun. Hubby got an actor fired and recast for entering armory behind his back. Yep. Um, yeah. And it's no, it's fuck you. I'm out. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's the thing. She, you know, if you walk off a set, I, I just want to say, like, let's assume, uh, let's assume she walks off set, right? She walks off set and it shuts down production. Maybe that does cause her problems for working. But let's, you know, people have said it would have happened anyway. I just want to look at the it would have happened anyway scenario. She walks off set, right? She She leaves. They go and somehow source a gun themselves and do it without an armorer, and Helena Hutchins gets killed anyway. Or they find another armorer who's willing to cut those corners and somebody gets killed. You know how much of a fucking hero you look like? If you're the person who's like, no, we're not doing this, I'm out. You know how much work you would be getting as the armorer who said no to the shooting? Dollar dollar bills, y'all. Uh, so, yeah. Um, that's the thing is if you can't walk, if you can't leave, you are not qualified to do the job. That is, that's a qualification. So, yeah. Um, armors can stop production. We can call cut. We can soup. Yeah, this is one of the things. Very few people have the, have the authority to call cut on a set. Um, you, it's not just everybody. Um, the armor can call cut. The armor can outrank people where it comes to, to guns. You know, if the producer or the director says, I want this shot, and the armor says, no, that's not safe, the armor wins. Or the armor should not be working. Like, that is, that's the order of things. All right, let's uh, let's keep going here. So the opening counsel for the and state I'm gonna put him talked to about Ms. Reed and tried to put all of the onus on her. At the time, she was 24 years old. She had been hired for two duties, a props assistant, you're going to hear what that is, and the armorer role, two different duties. And if she can't do the two duties, her job is to walk. This is, again, negligence on the part of the armorer. And like his defense is to say it's not her fault because she had all these things going on. And I hear this as a confession. Now, I want you to realize uh, at the end of the day, this argument may win. The prosecution's job is going to be to take this, this story, and cut it to ribbons, right? The This is going to be the critical thing, right? This is going to be the prosecution's job is to, is to point out that the armor should have walked. The jury right now, I think the jury is listening to to, to Shiny here. Um, I, don't, I just didn't know what, I can't remember. Bowls, there we go. Bowls. Um, 
yeah, they're the soup team because they got bowls and bouillon. So, <laughs> so this is bowls. Um, but you know, he, this is, um, the jury right now is listening to him and the prosecution needs to cut him to part, like cut him to ribbons. They need to cut this argument to bits. And the way they do that is with an expert who can testify like an ar a film armorer who's willing to testify. The job is walk. That is the, that is the job. So so they were splitting her between those and making her, for example, roll cowboy cigarettes. That was one KVB, if you ever want to come on, you're welcome have. to, but I can understand so why you to do that might not want to take to. away from her armor duties. You're going to hear about that. Now, OSHA is a New Mexico agency, and that New Mexico agency inspected the movie and investigated this shooting. I just want to say they are treading really, really close to the scenario or to what the the judge said they couldn't say. And I might have objected if I was the prosecution. They don't, but I might have objected. And um, I think that if they, when they try to explore this in, um, you know, in their, uh, in their case, I think we're going to see some objections, some fighting on this, some, um, because he's basically saying OSHA says it's not her fault. And yeah. After the shooting, you're going to hear that OSHA found fault with production. They found numerous faults, numerous mistakes on production's part, not Ms. Gutierrez Reed on production. You're going to hear that OSHA indicated that there was a rush set, that there was. Also, I think OSHA did find that like she screwed up, but yeah. Um, OSHA is designed to look at systemic faults, right? So, yeah. Several safety errors. And I'm going to talk about those in a moment, but I want to make that very clear. When the state talks about Ms. Gutierrez Reed being negligent, what really happened is production was negligent. Production put her in that position. Why would you bring OSHA into this? Because he wants to say that it's the whole film that caused this, not, you know, and she's just an innocent cog in the wheel. I would absolutely be running OSHA you know, OSHA's arguments, but like the, if they let him talk about OSHA, absolutely, I'd want to talk about it. But um, this is also still her fault. Like if it's a film set that is a disaster, her job is walk. So yeah. They put her in the position of having two jobs, a props assistant and an armor and expected a 24 year old under really tough conditions to keep up with everything that was going on. You're going to hear about that. You're going to hear that Ms. Gutierrez Reed emailed the production manager, Gabrielle Pickle, who's on the set. You're going to hear Gabrielle Pickle. And she asked her for more armor days. She said in this email, when I'm not able to focus on my armor duties, this is when mistakes happen. And she was. And this again is, oh, you knew that what you were doing was unsafe because you didn't have enough time. Walk, walk. Like, you knew it was unsafe. You kept going anyway. Walk. She was telling her this. Now, Miss Pickle came back and said, no, we only have eight armor days, and that's all you're going to get. So out of the whole course in the movie, they didn't allow her to be an armor and to perform those duties to the extent that she had to. Then take and your guns and go home. Point two. They, they moved her between two different things, props assistant and armor. Counsel for the state in his opening said that Ms. Gutierrez Reed had the job of sourcing the ammo and sourcing the firearms on set. Now you're going to hear when you go through this about another name, and her name is Sarah Zachary. Sarah Zachary was the props head. This is where we're going to end up with some really interesting things here. So as the head of props department, she was Ms. Gutierrez Reed's boss. In that role, Sarah Zachary had to source the ammunition and had to source the firearms. So that was not correct. What, what counsel stated in, in the opening. Why? Like, if Sarah Zachary is getting the guns and not the armor, I'm like, why? Um, now, I'm just going to note here on the age thing. I do, um, I do fireworks. 
um, just recreationally, right? I, I join firework shows and whatever else. Um, I'm going to say there's not a lot of young guys um, who are, uh, there's not a lot of young guys who are like heads of fireworks crew. Like, and the reason why is because it takes a certain amount of time to get the certifications. And it takes a certain amount of time to, um, uh, it takes a certain amount of time to get up to, um, you know, get that experience in. And if you don't have that experience, your role in things should be to say, um, no, we're not doing it. Like, no, that's not happening. So um, if you're too young to have the experience to do it, then don't. In reality, that was Sarah Zachary's job. Now you're going to hear that what happened is those two worked together in conjunction. Hannah was, uh, Miss Gutierrez Reed was supposed to be doing armor and she was supposed to run over and help Sarah Zachary whenever she wanted the help on props. So a lot of what you're going to hear is a chaotic scene created by production and forcing somebody to do these two different roles. You're going to hear witnesses in this case, including professional armor that the state has hired and other people that will tell you it's completely inadvisable and a terrible decision on a movie like this with so many guns that you have a part-time armor. It's and you will hear that. The thing is, is that your job, if you're the part-time armor, is to be the zero-time armor, right? Um, like what they're saying is basically she was being, you know, she was in a position where she was obviously going to end up as like the, the, the fall person for a disaster. Um, your job is to walk. Your job is to walk. Now, when he says you're going to hear experts, including experts called by the prosecution, uh, the defense couldn't get an armor. Uh, they actually complained about how they couldn't get an armor. Um, and so when they're saying you're going to hear armors called by the prosecution and they're going to say this is because <laughs> they don't have one of their own. Uh, but it's always really good if you can say the other side's expert agrees with me. That's fantastic. Um, Just it's not a good idea. And that's a, a terrible idea. But that's what they did. Now, as counsel stated, you, you will hear that the scene in the church was a blocking. It was a getting ready for a rehearsal. So you're going to hear that um, Miss Gutierrez Reed had brought the gun to Mr. Halls, that Mr. Halls uh, never should have handled that weapon. And you're going to see he had a lot of experience in movies. He knew better. He had the weapon. He knew he better. Not, uh, inspect that fully. And you're going to see that Mr. Baldwin didn't inspect it at all. So when counsel showed you that video on the first part of it, when he's sitting in that pew and doing that cross draw, you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear how dangerous a seated cross draw is. It's one of the more dangerous draws you can do because you're pulling the weapon across your body and you can also pull it across other people. So you're going to hear that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed specifically requested to train Mr. Baldwin in a cross draw. And you're also going to hear that he did not do that training. So um, somebody says he's blocking a filming term. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, this is a key point. No armorer who wants to work again is going to agree with the defense. No one uh, knows. No one who knows is going to help defense. She messed up. Bottom line, Elena Hutchins died because a lot of people messed up. Yep. Um, I haven't. I've talked to a bunch of armors. Most of them don't want me to use their name like or their firm because, you know, they said, hey, we'll talk to you. But don't freaking attribute any quotes to us uh, because everybody's kind of worried about this. Um, no armorer wants to be associated with this because they hate. They just hate what Anna Gutierrez did. So, um, yeah. Uh, now, so th the other thing we're going to hear a lot of is how much of a bag of dicks Baldwin was. Uh, and we're not at spicy time, so I hope YouTube doesn't give me crap for calling Baldwin a bag of dicks. But um, it's an accurate descriptor here. Uh, when the arm, like, but this again shows her inexperience and her lack of confidence because it should have been like, oh, uh, I said I wanted to train you in cross draw. That's a requirement. Like, that's not an optional thing. That's a, it's freaking happening. So leave your phone wherever the, you're, you like, because you can't bring your phone. You're doing the training or I'm walking. Like, you do the training or you don't get a gun. 
pick which one you want. And that's that's the job. He did not set that training up. So when this tragic shooting occurred, it was in the very motion of a cross draw. You're also going to hear that this scene, this blocking, didn't even recall, didn't even require him to draw that weapon. So it was just going to be an extreme close-up scene of his hand pulling out of his holster. And they were going to focus on that, create tension in the scene in the movie. And instead, for whatever reason, Mr. Baldwin pulled it out, and it ends up being pointed right at Miss Hutchins, the camera, uh, and Mr. Susan. This is funny. SAG has made statements that it's not the actor's responsibility. SAG also, before the like before the tragedy, made statements that it's that it is the actor's responsibility. So um, SAG seems to be playing a game where they want to cover for the actors. And yeah. Um, bad publicity is career ending for armors. That armor is a dick equals excellent accidental fire uh, equals never work again. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, there's a right way to be a dick as an armorer. You got to put your foot down. Um, you're also going to hear, we're going to talk about in the course of this case, there's Hollywood tricks. These guns should never be pointed at another person. That instead, what should happen is there's camera tricks that you can use to make it look like it's pointed, but it's not. There's also things we're going to talk about that, that Mr. Baldwin did at that moment that he violated and safety rules. Our gun and ammunition expert, Mr. Kuski, who you're going to hear from, is going to discuss safe gun handling and usage and go through safety bulletins. These safety bulletins apply on the set to movie actors. And he's going to talk about that. Second, let me talk about the live rounds. Now, the government has a, the state has a relatively new theory, which is based totally on pictures. And you saw some of those pictures. And it's also based on the idea that live rounds have a silver primer. Relatively new theory is, um, mm, I, I don't like that he snuck that in, but yeah. On this side. So that's going to be the core of their argument and their theory. And you saw in the picture, one of them had a silver primer. And the primer is just that circle in the middle of the round on the back where the hammer hits. And that's what caused the round to fire. Now, what, what you didn't hear in State's opening was that there's going to be numerous dummy rounds that also have silver primers that were on this set. There was a FBI report you're going to see that a box removed from the prop truck had 16 silver primer dummies. This is not a defense. <laughs> like, hey, there's a whole bunch of dummies and they all look different. Like, oh, come on and one silver primer suspected live round. So this was a box found in the prop truck. So the theory that all the silver primer rounds are live is not correct. Okay, but what you just told the jury is that there was a live round found in her prop truck. It's just not true. So you're going to hear during the course of this evidence, because of these silver primer dummies, that theory does not work. Second, you're going to hear that rust production ordered all the dummies on set. Russ Production sourced these primarily from a man named Seth Kenny. Seth Kenny owned so they're gonna PDP throw Props. Seth Kenny under PDP the bus? PDP Props was the primary supplier to the rest set. Now, you're going to hear that that after... And this I'm going to address, the allegation that you can tell because it's silver. The only way you'd be able to tell that it was silver is if they were using consistent dummies and that all of the dummies on this particular set had you know brass colored or whatever other color um primer in that case a silver primer would be an exceptional thing you'd be like what the hell is that that is not what's going on here but if that's not true i mean fair fair enough right but it is a, a weird thing that they've got all these random dummies that don't match um the shooting seth kenny was extremely active in contacting the sheriffs and trying to work with them and trying to point the finger away from himself. And you're going to hear about that. You're also going to hear that Sarah Zachary, who I told you about earlier, after the shooting, she sent a text to Seth Kenny and it said emergency. Now, Sarah Zachary works for Seth Kenny on PDQ props. She worked on set, but she was under him. She sent a text to Seth Kenny saying emergency. You're then going to hear that they had a phone call 
very shortly after. This was just minutes after the shooting. Sarah and Seth are talking on the phone. Now, we don't have that actual phone call, but whatever was said, here's what happened very, the very next thing. Sarah Zachary goes over and removes rounds from two of the weapons, two of the actor's guns, and she throws them away. Now, that's absolute and complete scene tampering. And when she first was interviewed by the sheriff, Sarah Zachary said, I was panicked. And that's all I can tell you. Okay, this, I think, is a really good argument from the defense. I would be going on like this, and I'd be going, why is Sarah Zachary throwing away critical ammunition or critical evidence from the scene? Why the hell? I would be hammering on this. And defense is. Um, defense is defense is going to ride this and this like a lot of their defense have said okay this sounds like a confession this sounds like a confession this sounds like they can spin this into a smoking gun and yeah people are saying who's the woman sitting next to sarah i don't know she is dressed in a very eye-catching fashion she is very um she's noticeable but I have no clue who she is. Um, I assume she's like a paralegal or something like that. Um, who loaded the gun? Hannah loaded the gun. Um, now, note, they said two of the guns. I don't know that it's necessarily this one. Now, I expect in the course of this case, you're going to hear that when she was interviewed, she's going to say something like, I threw them away because that's what we do after scenes. And you're going to get to evaluate her credibility and determine why would these be thrown away they're, if they're dummy rounds the rounds that can be reused they cost money it doesn't i'm i'm also going to say you don't throw away the dummy rounds right you reuse those those go back into circulation um so if she says that that's what we do after a scene no it freaking isn't um no it isn't so yeah to stay with Miss Gutierrez Reed because she's distraught. So he tells another person to go get the prop cart. The prop cart is over by the church. He tells somebody else to walk over and get it. So we're skipping ahead now, a little I bit think here. He's going to acknowledge that he should have gone, gone and got that prop cart. And sorry, I can't jump right to random, where I wanted to because uh, my timestamps got messed up because I couldn't you know use the video I wanted to but use. But this is law enforcement's job to secure the scene. After a shooting like this, you don't want evidence to go walking away. You don't want it to go missing. You know what? Because we're here on a reasonable doubt standard. That standard is the highest standard under our under our law. That means you can't convict somebody in this country, no matter who they are, unless you prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And what we've got here is theories based on evidence that has already been tampered with. And you're going to hear that in this case. That's not even going to be questioned. So you're going to have to take the leap that whatever Sarah took to the prop truck, we don't know. And whatever she did with those rounds, we don't know. And you may not know why. But I can tell you, it occurred right after the call with Seth Kenny, And you're going to hear about that. You're going to hear about his contacts with, with a uh, witness named Del Reed. Del Reed is the father of Miss Gutierrez Reed. Yeah. Del Reed is one of the most renowned armorers in the history of movies. That is true. You're going to hear that he's been doing this for over 50 years. That is true. He's trained Brad Pitt. True. Sharon Stone, Denzel Washington. He did Tombstone. Some All of this is true. Seen that. He did 310 to Yuma. He's the real deal. You might have seen Tombstone. You just did you just drop a you might have seen freaking Tombstone, my dude. Um, if you haven't seen Tombstone, folks, watch Tombstone after this because <laughs> Tombstone is a really good movie. Um, yeah, um, Tombstone. So, yeah, I mean, Thel Reed is a really big like he's a big guy in this, and Thel Reed is going to be there to point the finger at. Um, at Seth Kenny as part of this whole conspiracy theory of other people screwed up and, you know, and therefore, uh, you know, and that they were conspiring to hide their involvement in it. You know, he's got this conspiracy theory between Seth Kenny and Sarah Zachary and so forth. Um, and yeah, um, what is it? 
I'm your Huckleberry. Yep, I love that line. It's fan freaking tastic. Um, Tombstone is amazing. So, um, Dylan, have a good night. Um, so, all right, let's uh, let's keep going here. And you're gonna hear that he trained Miss Gutierrez Reed. She was very well trained. She also went to film school, and she completed a bachelor's degree in that. So you're gonna see that she was trained, she was educated. And she was ready for this job. Now it was her. I like three ten to you as well. Armor. You're going to hear that she had had one prior, and then she had also worked as an assistant on another movie. But you're going to hear that from the time she was a little girl, her dad, Bill Reed, had her on these movie sets, and he was training her. Now, Phil, the reason why I mention him is, is he and Seth Kenny, right before Rust started, were on another movie set called Yellowstone 1883, and that occurred in Texas. You're going to hear that Phil Reed brought live rounds. These were 45 Colt live rounds to Texas, and he and Seth Kinney were going to train the actors on a, on a range, not on the set, but on a range. So they sometimes train these actors to fire the weapon and see how the recoil is and kind of get a feel for it for the, the, the movie scene. So he brought these live rounds. So you see, Thel Reed is still implicated in the live rounds theory. And the other thing about the, um, you know, the other thing about the whole, like, live rounds thing... This is important. They're training on a range, right? People have said, oh, why would you ever use live rounds? There's no problem with using live rounds on a range. Like Keanu Reeves, who's, by the way, really good at shooting, um, trained a lot with Terran Tactical, and they um, they trained on a range. Um, and then they went, then Keanu went to film John Wick, and there were no live rounds on the John Wick set, right? So he trained on the range. Um, they did the training. They did Yellowstone 83. And then Seth Kinney kept these live rounds in an ammo can. He did not give them back to Thel Reed. And again, you're going to see these were 45 Colt live rounds. Fast forward. So the theory is that, that he keeps these live rounds and they end up on set. That we have rest set. And Seth Kinney is the primary supplier of ammunition to the rest set. You're going to see evidence in this case that Seth Kenny's rounds in a box that the sheriffs found uh, were blue. They were a certain color. And, and we'll remind you, as, as we go through, we'll highlight that. But they were a certain color. And you're going to see, for example, in the picture that the state showed you in their opening, the live round they said that was in that gun belt, it's the same color. So I see uh, somebody says, uh, my friend shoots competitively at, like on ranges like that, John Wick style. I shoot occasionally competitively three gun, um, but I am not good. Uh, I am not. I'm not top of the, you know, thing. I'm. I'm. I'm awful. And you're going to be able to put that together as the evidence comes through. It's the same color as the rounds that Seth had. They were blued. So basically, they're going to hear they're going to blame Seth. But you know that it's Seth via Thel Reed. They never took Seth Kenny's fingerprints. And they never took his DNA. They didn't take his cell phone. So again, we're going to be missing evidence. Knowing that Seth Kenny was the primary ammunition supplier. Now they're going to say like one of the points they're making is they're going to say, listen, um, are you awful or are you competitive? I compete, but I lose. So yeah. Um, so they're going to be blaming Seth Kenny and they're going to say, why didn't they take DNA off of these, um, off of these bullets? And the thing is, is that you don't typically get DNA off of cartridges. It's it's rare. So um, this is really playing with what they call the CSI effect. And the CSI effect has two prongs to it. CSI effect on one hand is that juries really overemphasize, um, you know, DNA tests or other forensic tests. They really, really overemphasize that. The second thing on uh, is that juries really expect a whole bunch of tests to be taken when they don't necessarily often get taken. You know, they don't necessarily fingerprint everything. They don't necessarily DNA test everything. And that's just because why would you a lot of the time? So, yeah. Knowing that he and Sarah Zachary had talked right after the shooting, Sarah had thrown rounds away. Sarah had moved stuff from the prop truck. None of Seth Kenny's phone, fingerprints, or DNA were taken. And you're also going to hear that there was no request to the FBI to check those live rounds for fingerprints or DNA. 
None. Now I think he's getting to so the last the thing FBI I want to hear from him was before we move requested on. Requested to do a bunch of forensic tests. They were testing the, the firearm Mr. Baldwin used to see if it functioned correctly. You're going to hear about other tests they did, but no testing on the live rounds. Zero. Again, that's going to be evidence that you are never going to see or have because the government didn't do it. I could probably again, beat a lot of cops, down but I can't beat most of the three gun competitors. Um, Our expert, Mr. Kuski, is going to talk about the government's theory, state's theory, about these colors and, and the rounds. And I talked about that earlier briefly, but I'm just going to say it again because it's so important. You cannot tell a live round from a dummy by a picture. And the reason for that is that the dummies are made in Hollywood to look just like live rounds. Now, that the point of that is the people watching the movie don't know that it's, not, it's, that it's a dummy. They're made to look just like a live round. Now, the picture Council for the State showed earlier showed a, a hole in that round. That is how they make some of the dummies. It's not how they make all the dummies. Some of the dummies, unfortunately, do not shake, and they do not have a hole in them. And you're going to hear that one of those rounds was on this set. Here's the thing. This is a terrible fucking argument. Um, because... Whose fault is it? So he's saying, you know, it's impossible to tell the difference between the dummy. Sometimes you look at it and you can't tell. Well, it should be able to make that noise. And if it doesn't make that noise, then, uh, you know, the other thing is, let's say this is a dummy. And let's say that this dummy doesn't rattle. And let's say it's got a, a you know, a killed primer in it so you can't see it. And let's say it's, um, you know, it's got no hole drilled in it. Let's say they even go so far as to put a little bit of sand in it so that when you shake it, it sounds like powder in it. This dummy sounds exactly like a real cartridge. Well, then the solution is that if you pick up this dummy and you can't tell the difference between this dummy and a live round, you don't put it in a gun. You put it in the trash. In fact, I would probably say stop everything. This looks like we have a live round. And then check it and be like, what the hell? If she's making and using and permitting dummies on her set, and it is her set when it comes to the guns, that, that look exactly like real cartridges... That is a absolute fuck up. And what he's saying is she was so negligent that she assumed that this could be a dummy, even though it looked exactly like a live round. And that she is so negligent that. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, this this argument, I wanted to throw things. This argument, I wanted to just lose my mind. And um, yeah, half Irish, I'm going to have to catch up on that and do some reviews of Law & Order Toronto to see how they do on Canadian law. But oh my God to this argument. Oh my God. If you can't tell if it's live or not, this is like saying, hey, look, um, I thought that this was, you know, I, I wasn't sure if this was a real gun, so I put it in my mouth and pulled the trigger several times to find out. Mm. By the way, that's not a good way to tell a real gun from a fake gun. Um it's going to be in the CSI tech, uh, Ms. Ms. Popple. It's in her report. It uh, is, it's actually. The round it's from Spain. causing a death through negligence is essentially what she's so accused of. It's a dummy of. that looks like a live round, and it does not shake with the BB, so you can tell. Then why the hell would Mr. you Kuski load it? going to talk about how this is highly dangerous. I mean, the thing is, is that there shouldn't be dummies like this. There shouldn't be dummies like this. It's possible to make one. 
it is possible to make a dummy that looks exactly like a real cartridge. That should not be on a film set. Um, it shouldn't at all. And the other thing is that if you had, like, if you encounter one that looks exactly like a real cartridge, that should be a stop everything. What the hell? Like, oh, yeah. Uh, John Eric Hexum died from a blank round, not a dummy round. Um, different, different uh, thing. And how Miss Gutierrez Reed was faced with a situation on the set of dealing with a mixed match of dummies, cheap dummies, he's going to call it garbage, that were just thrown together that she had to deal with. Again, while OSHA's going to tell you she's being rushed, she's having to perform two jobs, she's asking then, for more then resources stop and it. help from her manager, and she's not getting it. Then throw the flag. Third, you're going to hear that David Halls, the first assistant director. All right, I'm going to move on from him. I think he did a better job. I think a lot of his arguments are basically admitting fault, but it's admitting fault in a way that doesn't sound like it and that may sway the jury. The prosecutor's job is going to be to poke holes in all of these arguments. Uh, and somebody's asking, what is the difference between a blank round and a dummy round? Uh, a dummy round is intended to look like a real cartridge, but if you pull the trigger on a dummy round, it shouldn't do anything. It should have no effect. It should just go click and it should be inert. Like, you know, your blank round should be as dangerous as a cracker. You know, it. I can't shoot anybody with a cracker. Um, it should be exactly that dangerous. Um, less dangerous, for example, than a jar of my hot sauce. Um, whereas a blank round, a blank round has um, has a powder charge in it, but it has no projectile. So when you pull the trigger on a blank round, it will make a bang and a flash and smoke and so forth, but it won't send out a projectile that, you know, now it can still be dangerous, but it won't send out a projectile. Hello, hello. Hi there. So I was just talking about his opening. I thought his opening was really good bullshit. I didn't hate it. I did not hate it. If I was grading the opening statements, I would give the prosecution a C minus and him a B. I'd give the prosecution a C. Really? Yeah. I mean, they were boring. They didn't make too many big screw ups. But the thing is, it, it, it's your first chance to talk to the jury. It so, is. And I thought about this today of how I would do it. And the first thing I would have done is thrown a picture of, of uh, Helena Hutchins right up there and been like, this person died on this set. They were shot. And let me get us to that point. Basically, like, this person died. They were shot on a movie set. And that was the conclusion that we saw. And it was all around the news and let me tell you why that happened how that happened and there's several links in the chain and hannah gutierrez is a critical link and without her that would never have happened he's got two real problems one he's boring at the best of times two he breaks the fundamental rule of strong weak strong for openings and closings yeah um you know, you should be starting with the interesting bits. You know, Helena Hutchins, you know, bright young woman, well-respected, is dead. Lost her life, yes. And she is dead because people, including, you know, including Ms. Gutierrez, were careless and, in fact, cavalier about safety. And you know That what? is why this young woman lost her life. I and wouldn't have gone so far as to say, like, this is not about the allocation of guilt. This is not about the proportionality of guilt. That's not what this trial is about. This trial is about whether this person's conduct was a cause, a cause, not the cause, a cause to the death of Elaine Hutchins. And then you finish that up with, she may not have pulled the trigger, 
but she didn't have to pull the trigger to cause the death of Helena Hutchins. Because she laid the building blocks by her own negligence that had only one outcome, a death on this set. Yeah. And the, the prosecutor's strongest. I liked, his, I liked his ending. His ending was needed, great, but it was a terrible he delivery. Passion. He it needed was a terrible delivery. He needed passion to add to it. But like on paper, his ending is exactly how you yeah, want to end. It was perfect. It was perfect. Hammer it was with, a, his, with her own damn words. It was a perfect ending, but it was delivered by a person who could not and did not manifest an ounce of emotion throughout his opening. Like, yeah. At the end, we wish you did too. Great, great line. What a freaking great line. But deliver it right. Yeah, you can't sound like you're reading a phone book. And ultimately, you need to sound like you give a shit about Helena Hutchins. And that's the problem. He doesn't. Um, so, I did that to us so that we can actually be like side by side. That, that's fair. Weirdly proportionate. I yeah. made myself bigger to. I think we're going to need Zora's help. Zara's helping. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I didn't hate the prosecution, but I didn't think he did a... It wasn't... Like, the way I described it is, it was fine. It was fine. And, you know, like, that's it's not awful. Got, that's why he got the C-. minus. Like, he passed. But barely. Yeah, it's... It's not awful if you walk out of court and you're like, how was my opening? It was fine. But it's also like you're going to go like, oh, shit, it was only fine. Um, the, the the biggest problem for me was when he did get to. So two problems. One. When he was describing the rounds and the scene. There are nine million better ways to to say that story, to tell that story, like tell a freaking story. Use the different types of ammunition and tell a story. And that's that's the problem is he's not telling a story. He's reciting facts. And he needs to be telling a story instead of just reading a, like a, you know, reading a phone book story. And the second part that really turned me off and pissed me off was he got to Helena Hutchins and I will, uh, the tech issues, they happen, right? And oh, the photo yeah. comes up, but the photo's there. Don't read off a freaking card to relay the life story of the person who died. Don't do that. There's certain, like, you can't memorize a whole um, hour-long thing. Right. Because he his opening was like an hour long. You can't memorize an hour long thing, but you can memorize parts of it, critical yep. parts. And I would say your beginning, your end and your emotional moments should be from memory. Hit it em. should be. I watched I watched a very senior lawyer and they were like they were reading off of like you know, note cards through it. And then they got to the end where they're going to deliver the, and they very visibly took their notes, tossed them Set to the down. side, turned like they, they did a little toss, turned to the jury and just related. And I was like, this is so fake and so awesome. <laughs> like effective, so effective. sincere. Like it is, the most practiced sincerity you could see because it looked like the guy was just like, I'm done with my notes. Let's just talk to these people. And, but it, the only way that happened was from memorizing that bit, because if he ended up having to go back to his notes, done, like you've well, ruined that well, moment. Um, let me give you me a, give a better example. Better. And I'm, I'm getting feedback. Are you getting that too? I'm not, but it's okay. almost certainly me. Let me. It's probably let me, me. It's probably me. 
Um, one of the best examples is the attorney that stands up at the podium and they bring up with them a notepad, but they have their binder on the desk behind them. And what they will do is in the middle of an opening uh, statement or a closing argument, they will, in a moment, they will, they will, at a time when they need the jury to pay attention or the judge, they will stop. And even though they don't need it, they will walk back to their desk and look at the notebook and look at the binder and walk back to the podium as if they needed something from that binder. They don't need it. They know it. And that subtle little break allows them to pretend like they're looking at a note for something they have rehearsed. We've got and more video. They, del they deliver the argument. They, they the other, deliver the statement. The other one I've seen that I thought was really effective was they're reading, like they've got a, um, a binder there and towards the end of it, they close the close binder mm -hmm. and, but they did it. So it was like a thump because the middle is often where you're putting the boring but necessary bits. Let me explain. Like the prosecutor has to explain the blank dummy live distinction. Yes. It's important to the case. It's also fucking boring and he's yep. got to get through it. You sandwich that in the middle. So you interest them at the beginning. You drag them through it through the middle and then you get them interested again. So they remember that you, that you were awesome. Right. That's kind of, but once it was sort of a signal of this is the boring bit done. I want, I need your attention back now, please. Oh, or the best move is when the prosecutor has the, the closing, like the, the end of their opening statement, like really they have it in their head. They, they know it and they have the confidence to take their notepad or binder, whatever it is. And they close it. And then they actually physically walk back to table and, and set, set it, back. it down. And they walk back up and they put both hands on the podium and they look directly at the jury and then Although, they deliver uh, it. One lawyer mentioned that they inadvertently did the ultimate power move during the opposing side's close. Um, and the, the other side actually asked for a, a mistrial as a result of it. Um, they did a trial while they were terribly sick. And midway through the other side's close, they physically threw up. Oh, my <laughs> and they, the other isn't, side was like, I need a mistrial. It's like, this wasn't on purpose. They're like, doesn't eh. Emily have a story where she did that in court where she was when she was pregnant? She has that story where the judge would not excuse them and she had to throw up in court. <laughs> I've also had a client throw up in court. Um, it's and, and, and the people in the chat that are like saying it shouldn't be theater. But here's the thing. You are appealing. Is. You are appealing to human emotion. A lot the of whole lawyers. Point of the open and close is theater. Correct, and we there's a it, there's a CLE, a continuing continuing legal education course that I think that every lawyer should take. It basically says that actors and lawyers, what can we learn from each other? And it is so impactful when you realize what it means to actually grab a room, and what it takes to grab a room. Yeah, you need their attention. And I'm, I've given I'm, the example like of the moot court thing where my tie was below the collar and the judges were like, you did great, but I couldn't stop focusing on that little gap between the top of your collar and the top of your tie. And that was why I was commenting on Hannah's appearance today. And I think she nails that. Um, I, I think like Bowles and Bullion did a fantastic job getting her prepped in terms of like looking like she should because the jury is going to be watching her. Oh yeah. And she could not appear in this courtroom with like the purple and yellow because most of the jury are not going to be EDB oh, fans. Gray, are, baby. Gray, gray, gray. Yeah. Um, you know, you see sometimes like accused people who show up in like a bright red suit and I'm like, not the day for it. You want to look not quite like you're going to a funeral, but also not quite like you're not going to a funeral. Now, if that I makes think sense. defense counsel does well. He does really well. In I really liked this guy's delivery and oh, his. Yeah. The thing is, is there's a certain amount of he's trying to spin straw into gold. 
and he may do it. Like he may pull it off. But a lot of his arguments, I'm like, I think this is bullshit, but I think it's delivered very well and it's very convincing bullshit. And yeah, so and I think- I mean, that's good for him. It's just he's got less to play. He's got nothing to play with here other than no. um, other than the Sarah Zachary stuff. And um, but he he plays it like it's four aces. So. Well, and I, I think you and I have the same mind here where if this is a black and white reading of the law, right? Defense counsel literally admits the charges. Like literally. He admits the charges. Yep. But what he does, because he has to, because he knows that his client's interview is coming in. He knows all of the evidence. Like he knows that he can't deny negligence. He can't. But what he does is he throws to the appeal of the human factor on the jury. And it's that that little toss that basically says, yes, she was bad, but there are badder. He makes her sympathetic. He makes um, he gives an excuse for the jury to vote to acquit. Yeah. Um, And. I do have to say, I don't know what is with the woman who's next to Hannah because she is very distracting and a a very aggressive look. And people are going to hate me for saying that. But here's the thing. The courtroom is a theater. It is. And And people will judge you based on who you sit next to. They will. So, um, B Castle, I told you that it's the thing is, is that you can't sound bored when you're describing a death. I told you it's not the best phrasing. I don't know really what the best phrasing is, but you cannot sound bored. That is the moment you the jury can't. needs to be gripped. They, they need, need to be they need to be like wrapped up in the tragic horror of the death. Because and they it kept was in there it waiting for you to finish it. it it yeah. absolutely and that's why i was so pissed the way you start this opening statement is you show the picture of helena hutchins and you literally say this was a mother this was a this was a wife this was all of these were all of these things and because of the negligence that took place on this set on this day this person you- is no longer with us and you have to humanize her my god humanize her well, and the other thing you could say is like Helena Hutchins never saw it coming. No. She went to work. She expected that she would be safe. The first inkling she would have had that something was wrong was when that bullet ripped out of the gun held by Alec Baldwin and went through blood, you know, skin, bone, organs, and killed her. You and, and I, it but took you and I, her you... several hours to die. It and, took but... You know, like, make the jury angry. Make the jury sympathetic. Make the jury passionate about... Th- make the jury give a shit. The it's, jury it's... needs to care. They need to feel that the death of Helena Hutchins is a personal slight and attack on them and how they see the world. Not it's even just worse. It's a thing that happened. But it's even worse, though. Like, as you know, that statement of she knew when the trigger was pulled. No, she didn't. Every gunshot wound victim, whoever I'm a, I'm a defense reports, attorney, yes, but like, but every, every gunshot victim who reports like. being shot that, that first instance, there's a moment of shock where they don't, there's no, there's no feeling. There's no nothing. The pain comes after, right? There's that there's, surprise. There's, there's the noise. They hear the noise. They can remember the noise. And then all of a sudden there's, pain and fear one guy who the picture i had a client who got shot and you know he may have had it coming but he said that it initially he hears the noise and he felt like a pull yep and he was wondering like and his thought was what happened and then the then the pain hit him and he was like oh and then the terror hits like then it's like yes oh shit am i gonna die what's happened like you know that 
kicks in. Um, Describe that. That's your job. Make, make the jury understand that moment. Make the jury. And the thing is, we're going to talk about the next witness because the next guy they bring in is this firefighter. I think it is who like this guy. You got to fast forward a bit because they don't get to his his video until the lunch break is over. Well, they don't even I mean, they don't even show us his video. Um, and I'm not going to play the video because it's just like um, it's terrible audio. We're not really going to. The key bit for why this guy is on the stand. This guy basically has nothing to say. Um, he is boring. The defense pokes a few holes. The defense actually does a pretty good job with this guy. Well, they, they uh, don't, they, the prosecution put him on first because the, the prosecution wants the jury to forget him because of it's the prosecution puts him on for one purpose. The prosecution wants to put him on to show the video, but two, two purposes. First purpose video. Second purpose. He was the one that opens up the window to a lot of the defense's arguments of the scene. He's the first one there. He doesn't secure the scene. And, and that's the thing the, it makes complete sense. The person who's showing up on scene, a younger cop that shows up on scene is going to be so focused on that one issue, the life of the person in front of them, that they're not going to do all the other things that technically within their job description, they should, but, you don't want the defense to get a, a foothold there. You want them to make a few points and then you want the jury to forget it by the end of the trial. I mean, the it, thing is, if this guy hadn't seen the video, um, if this guy wasn't the, if it wasn't his body camera, I wouldn't call this guy. I would let the defense yeah, call true. if they want. I, I, I agree. Um, but you want this guy first because what, this happened like what this guy shows is the body camera as he's trying to treat Helena Hutchins. We, as the audience don't see it. The, what, what the, um, what, what the jury sees is they see Helena Hutchins fighting for life covered in blood. They see the whole tragedy of it. This guy does part of the job that the pro that the prosecutor should have been starting to do in the opening. Yep. That's why it he's up. Yeah. It they should want have gone the from emotional, emotional opening to yeah. this emotional person. And I mean, the defense does a pretty good job with this guy being like, isn't there a bunch of stuff you wish you could have done or would have done differently? And he's like, yep. Yeah, I do. And I'm like, fuck dude. Um, but you know what? I I'm you know what? Experience. I praise I praise the honesty. I praise I the praise honesty because he didn't lie. He didn't lie, but a more experienced cop would have handled that question differently. I know they would have said like gained, I think he gained points. I think he gained points with the jury by I think by the defense right. is gonna come back to this and say, you know, he admits that there's all sorts, you know, that he would have done it differently. He admits all of this. I mean, I think a more experienced police officer would have said, um, you know, there's always things that you can see in hindsight, but, um, you know, but at the end of the day, they weren't available at the time. There was nothing else I could have done. Second and cop that, does great. I mean, second cop does much better. And that's the reason why they put this guy up first, show the gore. They know that the, that the defense is going to score some points off him and then have second cop to patch those up. And when, and guys, for those of you in the chat, when Ian says show the gore, it's one of those things where this is trial. And when I don't forget that I said trial is theater. It is. I know that we're talking about a very sensitive topic. So does Ian, but trial is theater. It is. They theater. have, they have they to have to make impossible. Um, and the thing is, is they are going to like, the jury is going to see a horrible thing. And I can tell you, I can, like if I close my eyes, sometimes I can see those pictures and those videos that I've had to deal with. You know, I've had a file where a guy got shot with a shotgun and he lived, oh. but he was badly messed up on scene. And so there was pictures 
and video because they tried to get a statement from this guy because they thought he was going to die, right? They're interviewing this guy to get basically his dying words. And they thought, you know, we'll, we'll get those. And I mean, they didn't get a whole lot of him, you know, from him at the time because he was really, really messed up. But like that, like sometimes if I'm having trouble sleeping, I can see those like that video of this guy struggling and like, they're trying to ask him like what happened. And he's just sitting there going like, I want to live like that. You can see it on his face as he's like, I really, really want to live right now. Please stop asking me these stupid questions. Like I want to live. And that is what you want. Like that will shape how the jury looks at everything else. Yeah. They're going to see that. And anytime the defense is making an excuse, they're going to see Helena Hutchins, this young, um, you know, this young woman in the prime of her success of her life. Um, and they're going to be like, this is um, well, this, you know, we don't accept that excuse. And, so, and let me like touch back, touching back on the other point, like, Yes, this is visceral testimony, but how much you look at the impact it has and and, and view it like you would a, a movie, right? You watch yeah. a scene that's impactful, that is emotional, where you see the death scene. And I, I hate doing that because this is real life, but you know what? Movie is supposed to depict real life and it draws a certain emotional connection. It draws a lot of emotion, but let's say that you had the backstory and you had the emotional connection to the backstory and you feel like you knew this person and you knew them. And even if you knew what was going to happen to them, yeah. the delivery of that backstory is so important because it draws an emotional connection. That's why I was disappointed in the prosecution because they had the opportunity to do that. They just didn't. How's the video relevant? Um, oh, it's can relevant. Be used, it, you can prove use it to prove that Helena Hutchins was shot. You can use it to prove that she died. You can use it to prove all of these things. And sure, the defense can say, we, um, you know, we agree to that. But the prosecution can still be like, nah, we want to prove it. Um, it's, it's relevant. Um, it's so, I mean, this guy... Um, this guy did the best he could under the circumstances and he's very honest. I got no issue with this guy overall. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, this is why he's there. And the other thing, um, I saw some people in some of the chats who were unhappy with the fact that the court did not show us the video. No. And I'm going to say I am a hundred percent behind the decision not to show us this video. Agreed. Um, Helena Hutchins had, like at the time of her death had a nine-year-old kid. If they'd showed this video at some point, some little shithead in his school would come up and show him that video as part of bullying. Do you really want that kid to be shown that at the schoolyard? No. Do you really want that kid to, you know, have that, like to know that that's out there? Um, no. And and then weigh that against the public interest. What do we need? What do we gain out of that? Yeah, we know, we what, know what that video we know what that video shows, right? Yeah, we um, know what happened. You know, I don't need to see the blood. It's you know, we know that it's horrible, we know that it's tragic. Um just don't don't ruin the kid's life more than it has already happened. Don't um so, yeah, uh, somebody says, am I doing nightly recaps? Yes. Um, all right, let's move on. This I think we've talked about this guy enough. Um, let us move on to the next guy. Uh, this guy actually talks for a good long while, though. Um, but, I mean, there's not a whole lot to him. All right, so next guy. Now, I just want to show this again. There's a few moments that we see that just tell us what, you know, what Hannah's going through. Look at her motor skills here. Do you see the tremor 
in her motion? Oh no, yeah. she was she was terrified the entire time. Oh, she's absolutely terrified. Um Uh, solid suit choice for my man here. Like, wow. Black, black on black. On black. Yep. Um, you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right. Thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Um, so this God, guy. I love this judge. I love this judge so much. Um, she's a, uh, this guy is a retired sheriff. And he's the guy who arrives on the scene to preserve the evidence. So he's not the first guy on the scene, but he arrives on scene, um, you know, shortly thereafter. I'm going to move him up to one and a half. And yeah, when I said that she looks terrified, that's an appropriate look. That's why Ian was saying it. Like she looks yeah. terrified and she should. Being terrified is appropriate, right? It's just, um, there's a lot of people who want to paint her as a monster and she's not a monster. She's, you know, she's somebody who I think screwed up quite badly, but it is important to realize like, you know, and there's going to be the question of like, is she remorseful? Um, I think she's horrified by what happened. Right. I think, you know, she doesn't want to go to jail for it and who would, but she's clearly like, this is difficult for her. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing this chat. The judge is in Mason, a Mason grad. If that's referring to George Mason, that's the U university here in, in Fairfax. Um, I completely see that being both awesome and possible because Mason graduates some of the best trial attorneys that you'll ever see because they're right outside that DC bubble where all the. Did Rob go to Mason? No, I didn't. I went to another <laughs> another school that was kind of similar, where it was outside the cusp of a lot of these other big schools, but it was a, a school where they didn't get into the big school. And they went there and they became litigators. And they, and they, are, had, to, they had to learn and to fight. They had, an, they had an edge. They had a fight. And they had a no bullshit thing about them. Like, it's a, it's a book named Sue kind of thing. We, my <laughs> law firm, we, we try to pull lawyers from Mason. Like we try to get them. Because that's we like that edge. It's it's a boy named Sue thing. You gotta fight. Yep, you're a fighter. But yeah, I mean, um, it's. I think it's important to realize that she she is somebody who's got some emotion on this, especially because a lot of the time people will judge um, judge accused people for being too casual to whatever. Um, her reactions here are very human. She's not too casual about this. She's giving it the appropriate amount of consideration, which is that she's scared shitless. Yeah. So. And she's got a bit of a cough. All right. Uh, let us. All right. In July. Okay. Uh, and how are you employed on October 21st of 2021? I was a lieutenant with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. He's Department. retired. Give us an idea of your uh, background and experience uh, in terms of your law enforcement experience. Um, I did 20 years with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office, um, going through the ranks from deputy to lieutenant. How many years? 20 years. And did you have any law enforcement experience before going to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? Uh, I did not. Okay. And how did you- 20 years straight at one department. In, uh, the incident on October 21st, 2021 at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Um, I was a day shift commander. Um, we had gotten dispatched to the Bonanza Creek Ranch. What did you think you were being dispatched to? Um, dispatch advised that there was an accidental shooting with a prop gun. And what did you do when you received that information? Um, due to the nature of the call, I activated my lights and sirens and I uh, proceeded to the movie ranch. And tell us what you saw when you arrived. What was going on? Describe the scene to us. Um, coming upon the movie ranch, um, there is security. Um, uh, the movie ranch is quite large. Uh, one of the security guards at the time uh, told told us uh, that to follow him in because it was it was a uh, quite large. The, the movie set. he needed directions. Um, as soon as we got to the movie set itself, um, it was chaos. There was people everywhere. Um, Deputy Lafleur was already on scene. I didn't know where he was. 
and I was bring, being directed to the um, makeshift church. So guys, next time you watch a movie, um, sit through the credits and just see how many people they list. Um, and, you know, look at all the names of like the boring people who you don't care about, like the grips and there. like, you know, the gaffers and all of this, right? They're all on, they're all on scene, right? They're all, um, they're, they're all going to be present and they're all going to be curious and having different emotions, right? Some of them are going to be terrified. Some of them are going to be like looky lose. Some of these are going to be, you know, like wanting to meddle, like, Hey, this is so-and-so's fault, right? That's that kind of thing. Um, John Bayer says prop gun cannot fire live ammo. Wrong. Wrong. Because wrong. this was a prop gun and it did fire live ammo. Like <laughs> prop just means it is a thing on a movie set. That's all it yep. means. So and yeah. then uh, can um, I can I make a comment up? I'm gonna make a comment up Morrissey. So Morrissey oh, yeah. is the prosecutor who's leading or asking questions of this witness. And this is a She's really good so time today. Oh my God, this is such a good time to explain how lawyers are when they're arguing motions versus when they're in front of a jury or in court I, on trial. I think a big factor of it was the fact that she was on Zoom because, I mean, I have had to learn not to shout at, you know, the audience when I'm doing a live stream. You ha It is a different skill set. And one problem lawyers have is they can't hear themselves when they're talking. And so they think they got to get louder and more insistent and they're not yeah. getting that. You don't get that direct feedback. And so it's really easy to take a tone that is not ideal for that. So no, but, but, but she is, a, she is, I would put her in the category of scary because she is good. She's oh, very she... good at navigating a witness and asking questions. And she gets some objections for leading. It doesn't throw her at, all there's no condescending remarks she rephrases and goes right back to the issue it is she is really good she is i good. really like your trial work i really yeah. like her motions work i was like oh my god won't you shut up yeah. um i mean flip side the 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 person you guys called cousin rob <laughs> is also really good on cross like I, you are watching I, finally we have good attorneys that you're watching I actually thought that this was this was like very competently argued, competent yeah. to highly skilled. And the worst moments in this, I was like, okay, this is competent only. Like that the one opening. I was like, this is competent but not exceptional. She's Other moments, I I'm just like, and yeah, um, she has moments where she's you watch this moment where she's like she's caught leading. And you see her do this thing where she sort of sits back a little bit. She goes like, it's like the Google maps thing of like recalculating. Yeah. And then like, okay, here's how I, I know where my destination is. I know where I am now. This route that I wanted to take is blocked. Doesn't work. And she just picks a new route and she and, gets and there. And every time she gets to where they were trying to block her out from with that objection. And let me tell you when I, when I knew that she was good, it was way earlier than this. She asks him the question, will you please describe to the jury your, your training experience, right? And he describes that he's been a law enforcement officer for 20 years and says this other stuff. They, and she goes as if she did not hear it. And it was so smooth. It was so smooth. But she asked again, how long were you a law enforcement officer again? 20 years. It was that one re-emphasis, and it was such a very subtle thing that no one would have caught if you have not been doing trials. You wouldn't catch that she did that intentionally to remind the jury that this person has been doing this for 20 years. It was brilliant. And I'm going to address this. Like, people obviously have body language, and they obviously have, like, you can, you know, you can tell when somebody's, like, afraid or whatever else the problem is is that when you see the people who are like body language experts and they start getting into things like oh yes this is liar's delight it's like 
No, that is actually a concept that has no empirical support and is entirely made up bullshit. And that is basically astrology at that point. So it's the sphere of body language analysis as a thing is that they do no better in those tests than the average person. And in fact, body language analysis, you can get you can sway so badly because if you take a bunch of body language analysts and you seed them bad information, they will come to a, a different conclusion. If you take 40 body language you know, analysts experts and you put 20 of them into one room and 20 of them into the other and you show them the interrogation of a suspect, but you tell the one room this guy was ultimately cleared when another person confessed... The people who are in that room where you've told them that detail, their body language analysis is going to be like, oh, yes, he's very sincere. Mm -hmm. Whereas well, the people in the other room are going to be like, oh, he's clearly lying. And it's just because, yeah, it's. Well, and in, in two points on the body, two points. One on the body language. Uh, those who are critics, wait until you see her, Hannah Gutierrez reads her interview and tell me if it doesn't sway the jury one way or the other. And two, I'm not the saying point people don't have body language. I'm just oh, I know. saying, I know it's, it doesn't tell you a specific analysis. thing. So. Exactly. It doesn't tell you a specific no. thing. But the other point was the, uh, the comment I pulled up that basically said, um, I didn't catch it the first time until she repeated it. The 20 yeah. years thing. Well, I mean, she also went with the thing about like, oh, you're retired, you know, congratulations. Like, yeah, she's really hitting that this guy is, uh, She's basically spinning this guy into an expert without having to go through a Daubert hearing. And she does a great <laughs> job. She, she does, does a great job. Like, I would be sitting there going, I... Because it know, doesn't... You, it, it can't draw an objection. She she has not made... It. Yeah. It's, it's like, I'm upset by this if I'm defense counsel, I but I'm also shit. completely powerless. Yeah, and I can't do shit. Yeah, so it's like, mm, because she is going to use this guy to counteract some of the uh, the arguments they, they've been making. She yep. She's heard the defense opening. She knows that they're making an evidence tampering thing, an argument about police incompetence. And so, um, so one of the, you know, things she does is basically is like, you know, hey, um, why didn't you separate everybody? And he's like, too much of a zoo, not possible. You know, it's like, okay, that's that's awesome. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, all right, let's... Um, I'm going to skip yep. ahead a little bit because um, a lot of what he gets out is... Um, they also are using a lot of body camera footage for, or body camera footage for this guy. Um, and I don't want to be at this forever, but... Um, yeah. While you're skipping. Wait, got it. There you go. Um, go and on. so this is during COVID. So lots of people are wearing masks, although lots of people aren't. Um, and part of the reason is that it's, it's got to be like a gazillion degrees out there. Yeah. Well, side note, did you not mm -hmm. notice how beautiful the sky was? Like, cause I, they kept showing the body oh. cam footage and I couldn't stop looking at the sky. I want to go to New Mexico and like, just hang out. Mr. Benavides, why did you let that gentleman with the hat on go collect the rounds or the cart or whatever it was he said? I had three deputies on scene. I was taking care of the gun at the time and uh, the props person. Um, I had two other deputies trying to control their part of the scene. Um, I was keeping my eye as much as I can on the person going for the for the ammunition. Did he bring something back to you? He brought me the great cart that originally that we had gone and uh, we were looking for the gun that was used. That was the great cart that he brought back. All of and this is a problem. You saw that part previously. This is problems for the prosecution that the prosecution is, the prosecution is right now looking at a hole in the wall and they're throwing spackle at it. They're doing a great job too. They're making it sound like it's 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 like standard procedure. It's no, it's no big deal. Um, and Morrissey Morrissey's questions are not 
defensive. They are like, this is fine, right? Like, that's why I think this. she's so great at this. She makes it feel like this is normal. The other thing is that defense counsel really misses something that is in that particular exchange. Defense, like he says, I'm keeping an eye on this guy as best I can. Yeah. And later he testifies that there is no He's, way that, yep. that that the person could have planted evidence or anything without like me that. seeing it. I was looking without the whole time. It. And he says, I was looking I was, the whole time. And I'd be like, well, didn't you just say as best I could? Doesn't that mean that you weren't perfect? Doesn't that mean that there was a potential, you know, for like you want to hammer this guy as much as you can because the defense theory is, I mean, amongst other things, a cover up, right? Seth Kenny and Sarah Zachary working together to cover up some of the details. And, you know, prosecution, like all of this is bad facts for the prosecution that they are smoothing over and making look not so bad. Um, and the thing is, is that there's nothing the prosecution can do about this. Um, this is stuff that's already happened. And like, the defense does well with it, but I mean, the defense makes some um, makes some headway here, but not as much as they would like. And sometimes a win at trial is, if I can use a sports ball metaphor, that they only get the ball ten yards down as opposed to thirty. Well, right? It's like <laughs> you let me explain you prevent the damage or you limit the damage. And let me explain this question. If I were to read it in a, in a lay person's term, uh, dear sir, who was in charge of the scene. When you came upon the scene, you saw random individual a, who you did not know, did not know their name or what they were or who they were or whether they were involved in any fashion. And you pointed at said random individual, you sir, being in charge of the scene. And you said, go bring me the thing from which yep. this firearm that committed the discharge came from. Go bring me probably the second most critical piece of evidence that is needed in this trial. You, random person, not me, you, go do that, that I don't know. Bring it to me here. That's this question. But it sounds so nonchalant and not defensive and not scared that it almost makes you feel like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. I got a notification from some stupid program. I'm like kill program that probably played through. Yeah, no, I, I think they did a great job on this. Um, I think they did. Um, I think they did a good job here. I think it was actually quite, um, you know, yeah. Um, all right. Let's, um, uh, let's look at some more of this. Cause, uh, because the other gentleman walked you up to it, right? That is correct. Um, so when this gentleman brings you the cart, does it appear to have been... Uh, objection, pleading. Sorry. Sustained. It didn't seem different when the gentleman brought it back to you. Sustained. Um, how did the cart look when it was brought to you? Uh, the cart looked the same to me. <laughs> Leading. She's like, is it? Yeah, I guess. And then she asks again, leading. Okay. And then she's like, how'd the cart look? Now, the problem with leading Great questions move. is that once you've led the witness on something, they know where to go. You, They already know where you want to go. And I've actually, you know, sometimes you could say like, you know, if the, if a lawyer makes a habit of it, you can then throw it to the jury and be like, you know, or the judge and just be like, they led this witness so much that all of their answers are were basically fed to them by the lawyer, you know, in court. This um, was great, though. This, this was, was great. This is not, she wasn't, like, trying to feed this guy his story. It's just that when she got hit with that objection, and sometimes you object just to mess the other side up, like, just to take them off their, their game, doesn't work for her. Like, you can't... I thought she did really... Like, that's a great little moment there um perfect um 
it was in this order. There was still two guns on top of it. So what did we just see you do there? I cleared the gun and I secured it in the front of my unit. So what does it mean to clear a gun? Uh, I was making it safe for myself and for. Did you notice how idiot proof she made the next questions? Like she, and this is something I love when attorneys do this. I love when attorneys do this. When they get the leading objection, the next few questions out of their mouth should be so obviously not leading that it's almost insulting to the other side that they ever objected in the first place. It yeah. was, it was, and what did you do there? It was so open-ended and so not leading that it basically suggested to the jury that they never should have objected in the first place. Yeah. Great move. Great move. Um, for the crime scene tech who, or a detective that would look, look for it, uh, look at it after I secured it. Did it have any ammunition in it? It did not. So that's Hannah. That's her usual look. That is, that's a cool look. It's that not a pause, cool look for court. Yep, that pause frame was intentional, and they knew exactly what they were doing. Oh, I and, I paused here. Well, you paused there, but the thing is, that video intentional. This is courtroom oh, I'm theater. Sure, I'm sure they wanted you know people to see Hannah on the scene, but the thing is, is Hannah on the scene was going to come in, right? It was going to come in. Um, but this is not how you want to look in court. The other thing is, you know, when he says he makes it safe, to make a gun safe, you're going to unload it. You're going to check that it's unloaded. And that's sort of the, the steps there. It's unload, show clear, check, check, check. It's what they should be doing there. Yeah. I'm being you told know, I should try that look. <laughs> the the question we never get an answer to where are the rounds where are the other rounds we don't get an answer today uh but defense is going to say sarah's at like defense's position is that sarah zachary threw them out i know that's what i'm saying is where are the rounds like that that part i would have hammered that part nine million times over yeah um what did you do with that gun? Yeah, there's the I pause frame. I in the front of my unit and I locked the door. Oh my God, fuck. Are they okay? They started to off. We need more units out here. Huh? Now the thing That's is, the is lawyer. Showing, her showing concern? is probably better for defense. Isn't that the lawyer talking to them right now? No, the lawyer that is on scene is uh, is female. Is that later? Okay. But yeah. how do you allow the lawyer to talk to the witnesses? How do you stop them? Well, they've got a right to isolate counsel. them. They have the right to counsel when they've been interrogated. No, they have a right to counsel before they get interrogated. False. That's actually not true. Not in not in the U.S. No, you can isolate them until you ask them a question. Their right to counsel does not exist until they are questioned. You can isolate them. That's and that is a caveat that people often forget. You can isolate the witness. Because they're a witness and you can, you have an interest in preventing that witness from having third parties in inflect or, or impose upon that witness before you have had the opportunity to even address them. They don't have the right to counsel immediately. It's only when they are interrogated. I mean, I would try to spin, oh, you, you wanted to keep them from talking to their lawyer. You wanted to keep them from getting legal advice. Mm. Nope. But I want to keep them from getting their facts screwed up. And I want to and give them the opportunity to ask for a lawyer when I have told them I am asking them a question. That's a big issue. I mean, here the expectation is that a lawyer is not going to, like, you know, shade them. Um, there are situations where, like, they can separate you from a lawyer, but 
here she's not even a like she's not detained. I don't know that they actually have the ability to control her movement if they she's can. not. But in the US, you can you yet. can control you can control witnesses. You can but you they can haven't isolate witnesses. They haven't detained her yet. I know, and they don't, and, and and that is part of the that's part of the fact that that this entire investigation, I think. The defense makes really good points here. Really good points with I mean, how they in, mismanage the scene. In theory, because she wasn't detained yet, she could have gone to her car and driven home. She, They would have stopped her. Would they? You can and stop maybe. a witness. You can stop a witness and detain a witness without any... Well, they might have detained cause. her, but until they actually do, she can leave. Well, she could. And now that said, that, if she that, had left the scene, that would be an interesting way of going about factual, it, right? It would be a factual problem for defense at this stage because yeah, I, they would I, say, "Why I, did I, you leave the scene? Was that awareness yeah. of guilt?" So yeah, yeah. I see people saying they would detain her immediately. This was a gong show, That's so here he brings over the cart. Random, random dude, random dude, just random dude. Same part. Yeah. Okay. She's wearing a Punisher shirt. Can I well, can I make a comment to people in the chat like and, and, and anyone else who watches this? Everything after that gunshot rings out. You have to assume you at some point in time will be considered a person of interest or a suspect. Oh yeah. So it is in your best interest to sit down, shut up, don't say a word, and wait until the officer says, I would like to ask you questions, at which See, point people, you say, I would like my attorney present. See, people saying it's a misfit shirt. It's a big skull pattern. Um. This like, body this, cam footage would be avoided if people really understood you are a person of interest, sit your ass down and wait till you are questioned and then say, I would like my lawyer present. People say misfits. I'm, I'm looking at misfits shirt online. I'm not seeing one that's similar, but um, it's a skull. Being on body cam in a skull shirt is not ideal when you're, um, you know, when there's a shooting and you might be a suspect or a person of interest or charged. She wouldn't so, have been if she had realized that she was a person of interest and sat her ass down and waited until she was questioned and said, I want my lawyer. There's also a ton. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that if she had kept her mouth shut rather than doing her interview, um, if she hadn't turned over her phone, um, she probably would have been viewed as a witness rather than anything else. Um, I'm told misfits flag skull shirt. It doesn't matter who it is at the end of the day. It's that she's wearing a skull shirt and that is not an ideal look. Um, yep. I, okay. I see the shirt there. It is a misfit shirt. Um, regardless, it's a big skull. Like this is the time that in hindsight, I bet she wish she had zipped up her jacket. Or like sure. It's her ass down. Zip sure. Her it's jacket a zillion up, degrees, but said like, nothing. Yeah. Um, sure. It's a zillion degrees out there, but, uh, I, yeah. Um, I've got a whole rant about the things people wear to court too. I've had clients who I had a client who wore, uh, who, um, who came to 
uh, court wearing um, like crooks and castles is a common one. Cocaine and caviar, um, especially when they're charged with like possession of cocaine or dealing cocaine. That's yeah. a bad shirt to wear. Um, yeah. I had somebody who the judge went off on because he came in wearing a Sons of Anarchy shirt. And the judge thought it was a real biker gang. And I had to explain to the judge that it was just a fictional biker gang off a popular TV show. Because the judge is like Taylor, 87. Know. Taylor Shabusiness and Jeffrey Dahmer. Yep. That one. Um, frustrated user. If she had asked for a lawyer, wouldn't the complaints be about that? No. Probably. <laughs> they cannot. They cannot bring that in front of the jury. I, I mean, the defense can make an argument about it in terms of exclusion. So that might have been part of an argument in motions in limine if there if there's an argument of improper behavior. But the prosecution can't say you spoke to a lawyer, therefore you're guilty. And they can't say you asked for a lawyer. They're not allowed to even yeah. raise that request. If if you say, I want to talk to my lawyer, they cannot play that. They cannot show that. They cannot show anything about that. Yeah. They don't want the jury drawing the inference that you asked for a lawyer because you were guilty because... You know who should all, you know, guilty people should ask for a lawyer. Also, innocent people should ask for a lawyer. Um, so, yeah. We saw you take something. Uh, what did you take? They were two white boxes um, of rounds that uh, uh, the prop person. I hate how often they just oh, zoom no, right in on the yeah, uh, this person yeah, uh, the parties that you took those rounds from the person it's, that's right here. In the show me the person Did testifying. Yeah. Yes, it is. Do you like? I gotta say, if I was the judge and they're doing a uh, you know, and I'm uh, and they're saying, "Hey, we want cameras," I'm like, "Absolutely, you can have cameras." Um, they can point at the stand and they can point at the lawyers, but they aren't going to point at the parties. Um, like they can only point at the places where people talk from not, you know, you can't just be sitting there zooming in on the, you know, cause there's no value to this. Um, and yeah, it was especially gross during the Maya trial. You see Ms. Gutierrez sitting in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you just go ahead and point her out and tell us what she's wearing for the record? Uh, she's wearing a gray jacket and a white top. And also just for the record, where is Bonanza Creek Ranch located? Um, Bonanza Creek Ranch is on the um, Southern end of Santa Fe County. Um, it's off the frontage road, I-25 frontage road. For the record, state of New Mexico. In the state of New Mexico. Thank you, sir. If you had a question about who Hanna Gutierrez Reed is, Court TV just kind of show you. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing is you can't possibly avoid doing something that looks stupid for, um, you know, eight hours a day for, um, you know, for three weeks. Yeah. Eventually you're going to do something like pick your nose or make a weird face or something. And then they're going to play the, you know, look at Hannah's face during like, well, you know, yeah. whatever testimony. And it's like, maybe she just had an itch. Like she was just trying to keep oh. from sneezing after like a long, you know, so. Um, court, I mean, court TV is, is, is becoming too much like, We've talked about this privately. Core TV is becoming too much like the uh, let's get clickbaity stuff when all yeah. we actually watched them for was show me the trial. I watched them because it was show me the trial. I don't want the bullshit. I don't want the clickbaity stuff. Stop doing it. Court TV, do better. Law and crime, do better. All of you who are doing court coverage, show the fucking. Oh, wait, hang on. Time. We're, we're, we're okay. You're good. No. Show also, I swore plenty. <laughs> hearing. Show the hearing. Show who's talking. I don't want to see her when that's being said. I want to see the witness. I want to assess the witness's credibility. I want to see what they are testifying to and how they're testifying. I want to see yeah. if they're looking at the attorney or looking at the jury. I want to see all of that. I don't want to see the random close-up shot of Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Back up. Yeah, it's... Where the fuck are these? Is she okay? I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I just... 
Now, she's asking for information that they can't tell her because, like, they can't give her information before she provides a statement, right? Um, I just, I mean, she's, the prosecution was like, she was anxious and whatever else. And I'm like, no fucking shit, right? Um, no kidding. She was anxious and freaking out because like, yeah. Mr. Benavides, do you know why the helicopter is still there? Um, the helicopter, in my experience, lands and they try to, to um, stabilize the victim before they fly him out. The victim has to be stable before they fly him out. Can that sometimes take time? Yes, it can. From my experience, yes, it's technically objectionable, but fine. Yeah, it was leading, but whatever. But you got a body cam. Do you remember where those boxes of ammunition are right now? Yes, they're on the on the left side of the cart on a piece of paper. And are are you keeping an eye on them? I am. And you saw what she they She's looking all over the place. Did you see them when she handed them to you? Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on them. It's like, dude, you're trying to track a million different things. You're not so yeah. I mean, this guy goes through a lot of the video evidence. The prosecution is um is gonna basically try to establish that this is a chaotic scene and that he's the cops are doing the best they can. And that's correct. However, that works for both sides because the defense can say it was a chaotic scene. Sure, they were doing the best they could, but it means that they failed in all of the, you know, a whole bunch of ways. Now, I'm going to skip through a whole bunch of Yeah, I can't get over the sky in these photos. Oh, it's so beautiful. Um. So cross. That might be a question for Deputy Quintus. I should I have asked? Yes, I should have asked him why he was in the, within the yellow team. You were in charge of this scene until investigations took it over, right? That is correct. Yes. All right. So th this guy was here for some time, uh, monitored by this deputy. As the scene supervisor, are you concerned that if this gentleman reached over once over the tape and interacted with the cart, maybe he did it again? Um, in front of Deputy Quintus, I don't know. Okay. I like the. Um... I like that question in part because it's one where you like this one is an example of breaking the rule of asking a question where you don't know the answer because he doesn't know the answer, right? Maybe this guy was concerned. Maybe he wasn't, but either answer is good for the defense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yes, I was concerned. Cool. Um, cool. That, you know, then why didn't you do something about it? Or I wasn't concerned. It's like, oh, you, you had no worry about that. Oh, well, that's, you know, that's casual. That's pretty, uh, you know, lazy about the evidence. And here he's like, I don't know. It's like, that's great, too. There is no bad answer to that question. So it's a great question. Um, my favorite questions are the ones that the other side can't answer that. Yeah. Ouch. What was the uh, I missed that one. Hey, ow. Now. Let's talk to you about that gun. Uh, you said when you got the gun, you made it safe. What does that mean? Um, I looked in the cylinders to make sure there was no um, ammunition inside the cylinder. All right. And <laughs> does this guy have a lawyer? Yes. Yeah. So nobody's asking this guy any questions yet. Be, it should have been still in there because it's a revolver. Yes. And it would be highly relevant evidence in this case, right? Correct. All right. Fun story. Um, there was a case in Canada and. Um, where the the prosecutor was asking this guy, their theory was that this guy knew he'd done something wrong because he picked up the brass from the scene. And then he's like, well, when you shoot the, the revolver, the brass comes out. And he's like, no, that is not how revolvers work. Yeah. Um, for the people who don't know, a semi-automatic handgun, when you pull the trigger, it cycles the action and it ejects the, uh, the brass. A revolver the ejection of the brass is done by some idiot, which is you. That's, you know, you have to do that. So, yeah. 
Now, on the video we listened to, uh, you can hear my client Hannah talking to Mr. Dave Halls, the first assistant director, and they're talking about uh, you know where that ammo is, right? I don't know what ammo they're talking about. Is it? What's your understanding as to where the ammunition inside of the 45 caliber gun you collected went? I never asked that question. I do not know. You have no idea where that ammunition is? The one that was in the cylinder? No. What about the other five? Uh, I do not know. Good pause. pause. I mean, part of it is, I think his pause is also he's figuring out where he wants to go. But yeah, the other that's a good pause. Expert witnesses, like witnesses with some knowledge. I wanted to say expert witnesses is in. They have practice testifying, but that's, of course, expert witness has its own meaning. Um, witnesses with experience, when you ask them a question that they don't know, they will say, I don't know. Yeah. Less experienced witnesses will start to guess at the answer. And when they do that, a skilled cross-examiner can destroy them. Yeah. I... Is this my cousin? Comes now. Great value brand, Rob. Oh, my God. <laughs> Is this my cousin? I feel like like the comment has been made in a private group chat, but I'm now seeing it a little bit. He's wish.com Rob. I I wouldn't I wouldn't do that to him. He does good. He's a he does a good job. It's can we have Rob? No, we've got Rob at home, and then Rob at home. This guy. Oh yeah. Okay. He does good. Like he he's a skilled lawyer. He does. Um, he was boring AF in motions court. He's good on cross. Oh, he's good on cross. I don't motions motions trial. Different people. Different Motions. Lawyers. I, I literally thought this guy was freezing time. Oh, because it was like, uh, it was like this guy talks for, uh, you know, 20 minutes in motions court. And I was like, how many hours was that? It's like, oh, that was zero hours. Cause it felt like way more than zero hours. So yeah, this guy's good, um, in trial. He's good. So yeah, I, I like this guy's cross. Now this pause is too long. He's looking yeah. stuff up. And what I, I know you said initially only had three three deputies, but uh, I've seen a lot of that would look like vehicles on your lapel video. Uh, why couldn't you have sent these witnesses to go just wait in their cars and told them not to talk to anyone? Well, the the scene being so big. Go wait in your car. You know what happens when you tell everyone he, to go wait in their cars? <laughs> he I mean, knew this... it was a bad question the second he asked it. You look at look at his yeah. eyes. He knew it was a bad question the second he asked it. Look, watch. Go just wait in their cars. I told him not to talk to anyone. Well, the <laughs> yeah, that little, that look up to the left. He's like, oh shit, that was a dumb question. Um, I think he improvised that that question. But yeah, everybody go to your cars. Everyone is going to be gone in 10 minutes. But like, he's trying to find his footing, but he does. That little pause, wait till the next question. The scene being so big, we try to keep everybody it gives a little shake of his head at place where we could keep an eye on everybody. Um, to send people back to their vehicles. I don't know where their vehicles were. I don't, because on a movie set, there's staging areas. And I don't know if that staging area was somewhere else. I do not know. He's like, I don't want everyone fucking off. I want them here. Yeah, yeah. Now he's trying to figure out how to recover from that. He's, he is. Uh, just a minute. I've got just a couple more questions and I'll be okay. wrapped up. By the way, this almost always happens. You've got a witness on the stand. Yep. You're almost done with them and you're doing this check to make sure like have I fucked up and missed the key question? Yep. And I have had, I had a trial that I, in this moment, I was like, oh shit, what about this? And that thing was like a critical thing I needed to ask that witness. And like, I just almost forgot it. Um, that's why you take notes. 
for the prosecution, usually it's, did you prove jurisdiction? It's that way. It's, it's, did you prove jurisdiction? <laughs> like, and you go back and say, where did this take place? So for the chat who probably haven't run like trials or thought about criminal trials or anything like that, the prosecution has to prove every element of the charge. And so um, if, if they fail to prove some element, then you can, you can like sometimes just ask for a directed verdict where the court is like, yep. And one of those is jurisdiction. Did this offense happen in a place the court has authority over? Because the court doesn't have authority over everything. This court could not hear a criminal charge for something that happened here in Canada. It would have to be a Canadian court. So at some point it has to come out that this is New Mexico. And if nobody, if they go through this entire trial and they never say that this happened in New Mexico, they lose. And it happens to prosecutors every once in a while. Like it's not super common, but it happens. Um, John Bear, I'm not touching the Trump stuff just because as a Canadian, my chat will be entirely like F you Canadian. <laughs> Bronca called him the law and lumber guy. Yeah. Um, the, um, the other one that sometimes gets missed is identity. Yeah. You know, you don't like you saw where they said, like, do you see Ms. Gutierrez in the courtroom today? And he's like, yeah, she's over there. She's the person in the gray jacket, white shirt. That's to say this is like the person who has been arrested is actually the person who did the crime. Because mm -hmm. I have caught a prosecutor missing out on identity. And I'm like, they never actually identified my client as the person. And the judge is like, um, Crown, I was waiting for it all day for you to, to get that out. And you didn't. And the prosecutor is like, uh, can we read back the audio? And the judge is like, we can. I can tell you I was listening for it all day and I didn't hear it. So can you tell me like which witness you think got it out? And they're like, I don't know which witness. I'm sure I did. And the judge is like, are you? Because the judge doesn't want to have to go through six hours of audio. <laughs> yeah. And so eventually the prosecutor's like, I don't know. Um, and the judge is just like, yep. Um, nope. You, you lose. Yeah, um, and to this point, he did say New Mexico. We're not making that point. We're just saying that yeah. this is why he's looking back at his notes. He's trying to double check. And it could be that this witness has some sort of critical element, right? That he wants to get out or some pattern of questions that he wants to ask. And if he just doesn't, um, he just doesn't remember to ask it. So that's what he's doing right now. He's checking to make sure he's ticked all his boxes. Uh, somebody says, what if the client drastically changes their appearance? It can be a problem. Um, as a defense lawyer, I'm not, um, I'm not allowed to recommend my client change their appearance for improper right. purposes. Okay, I want to show you just a couple um, uh, specific times. But Hannah Gutierrez, I mean, there's no issue with like making her look. This is you know, good boring. Look at those over there. This is good. Uh, part. Can you see on the screen the two vehicles behind your vehicle? Yes, I see two vehicles there. All right. Could witnesses have been placed there? One bit. One. I, I don't know. Um, Objection calls for speculation. Can you rephrase your question, please? Is there some reason uh, you do not have witnesses staying in those cars? Like I said, the fluid was big. I mean, the scene was big. We we're trying to corral everybody into one <laughs> into one big. place where we could watch them and tell them not to talk. I mean, you, are you telling me you couldn't watch those people if they're in those vehicles? I had I had had them back in my unit. Okay. Um, we were... I gotta stay with Anna. The other thing is, New Mexico's like you saw that sky. That's I'm... gotta be a hot day. No, it's not. There, it, it it's it's deceptive. It's deceptive. I it's was just cooler thinking than you, you think. Somebody the altitude, in that black the altitude is higher than you think. I was just thinking you put somebody in that black truck, you close the no. door. No, um, it's not that hot. They're fine. Okay. It's the it's the next it's the next series of questions. Keep going. I was just figuring that they would find like uh you know the person would be like chewy bacon. All 
All right. Are there several vehicles uh, looking straight ahead here? Yes, sir. Is there a reason you didn't ask to house the witnesses uh, in those vehicles? That's farther away from what we wanted, and we won't be able to control the, the scene. Change in reason. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's kind of similar, so. I wonder if he gets back, to, does he get back to the 90 second video? The 90 well, second Judge video. Have a, a moment before passing the witness. Sure. Oh, dang it. We passed past it. The 90 second clip that he shows of the officer spinning around and moving yeah. around. That was mm. his best moment where it's like you were looking at the, you could see everything. And he's like, yeah, I could. It's like, uh, but didn't your, did your mind do one? Thank you. So he checks again and he checks with his colleague. Like, am I, is there anything I'm missing? Should I go to anything? Redirect. His colleague says, I think you're done. Now she has a good moment here. Um, I just want to see if it's, uh, Yeah, we're at one and a half. I mean, their point is basically everyone could have talked to everyone, and yeah. And, and this is the thing: in in most cases, that doesn't mean anything. In this case, that means something. There's a reason for people to come up with a story and blame yeah. one person as opposed to everybody else. This is a case where that works. The point the finger at somebody else. It doesn't work in every case, but this is one where it does. Where it could. It could. I mean, this is going to be uh, this is going to be the prosecution's argument for sure. Or sorry, the defense's argument. Just one minute. Ah, uh, the tech problems. Well, and and I keep looking at the chat. The fact that so many people are commenting about the lady to Hannah's left at the defense table. Says that they should tell her to dial Let's it back. Let's be clear. Yep. Do you have any reason to believe that that gentleman in the hat tampered with any kind of evidence? No, I do not. Any reason to believe that he planted any evidence? No, I do not. Speculation. Well, he Come crime on. crime scene tape and touched that dummy round on the cart. Were you there? I was looking straight at him. Yes, did he plant any evidence? No. He picked it up, shook it, and he put it back down. Speculation. These are objectionable yes. AF. Um, yes, I would have noticed. Yes. Some of these are observations. I'm going to go through uh, this slowly with you. And also to the chat. Even on your I video, really what he is down. reaching into. Yes. It's a little uh, cubby hole, and there's quite a few rounds in there. When he shook it, did it rattle? I do not remember. How would he have heard? Oh, is this when she brings well, up the rounds? Yep. These cars that Mr. Bullion asked you about, why you don't have witnesses in these cars. Do you own those cars? I do not own those cars, no. Do you know who owns those cars? I do not. Good point. As a police officer, are you allowed just to take a witness and put them in some vehicle that, that, that you don't know who owns the car? No, I'm not. Leading AF. Yes. And you can go on. Yeah. Have you ever done that in your entire career? No. Better question. Yes. Especially given that it's like, oh, right. Sir, and you were at this for how long again? Just to be clear, you indicated to Mr. Bullion that your video is facing one way, but that doesn't necessarily show us what you're looking at. Is that right? That is correct. Good do you question. have a full range of motion in your neck? Yes, I do. Do you have Great any question. injuries that would prevent you from doing that? No one. Oh, solid. I love the question because it's such a stupid it's, freaking it's question. It's so great. And 
it's the stupid question that makes the other side look idiotic. Yep. And the way that she does it too, where she puts her hands like this, like you can do this, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, oh, that's such a good question. Now, I mean, it is a bit of a dangerous question because if she asked me, I might be like, well, the answer to that is no. <laughs> I, you know, I, I do get a bad back. Sometimes it does hurt to do this or this, you know, it's like, so, um, I like the whole thing of like, is there any reason you couldn't turn? And so good. you see Bowles is looking at this like, oh, crap. Um, I also like somebody who's calling her Cleopatra here. <laughs> her expression. <laughs> Not bad. It's like, all right, you're you're doing good. Can you think of a reason that it took a while to get the crime log started? Just speculation. Oh, oh my god. I was trying to get deputies assigned. Um, um you know, checking on everybody, checking on the on the victim. If they don't object. Um I, I do not know. For the first half hour that you were on scene, did you have enough personnel so that someone could start doing paperwork? No. Good question. Is a crime scene log paperwork? Yes, it is. Good That's question. A good follow-up. The gun that you put in your unit, who handed it to you? Hannah. How many rounds of ammunition were in the cylinder when she handed it to you? None. See, Thank that's you, a problem for me. But that was a good question for the prosecution because Hannah had the firearm in her hands without anything in it. Like, so Hannah knew that it had been emptied. That was Great the moment question. I wanted to show. Because it's like... Great question. Oh, it's a devastating question. It is just like, you know... Because they're trying to make this as this big conspiracy by, um, you know, uh, by inference, Seth Kenny and them. Inference or implication, yeah. And now the jury can be like, wait a minute. Maybe the conspiracy is actually Hannah unloaded the gun. It or puts into their head them. that Hannah did it. And if Hannah did it, then it just makes her look super, super guilty. And which, I'm just which like, makes like that makes drawing attention to it even worse. Like, so now you're drawing attention to the, the cartridges not being in the firearm, but the last person to have it in their hands happens to be the person who's being charged. Like that is so much worse. Yeah, I thought that was just fan freaking tastic. And um like that was that was beautiful. Like just beautiful. Um I'm sure that defense doesn't think so because, you know, <laughs> this is a bad place for them, but um I I like this prosecutor. Um In somebody trial? was like yeah. Yeah, in motions, not. I think she probably would have been much better on motions if she wasn't on freaking Zoom. That's my that's my feeling on that. Um, I could be wrong. Could be you put her, you know. Could be she just sucks generally on motions, but yeah. I see people um, saying um, that uh, Cleopatra's bird nest crown is uh, is distracting as hell. Yeah, oh, I get it. She really is distracting in this room. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump off. I have court tomorrow and Fair I enough. need sleep. Uh, but tomorrow you're going to do recap and I'll do F and F and your recap's going to be at like five my time. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, tomorrow the recap should be less time because Evidence. it's going to be less opening. Um, yeah. the opening is going to be, um, the openings take a little bit of time. The witnesses often you can summarize and we can hit sort of key points if desired, but um, the openings I sort of wanted to go through in a little bit more detail. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to do the recap a little earlier. I'm probably going to run it at like five, my time, which is seven year time. And, um, and then, yeah, I'll, uh, I'm sure you'll probably get started before I'm done, but I'll put a, um, 
I'll put a what do you what a what is it called the uh, redirect, redirect the redirect yep yeah so yep. we can all finish up here and then move on over so and then we'll catch up and I'll I'll hang on uh, to the Gutierrez Reed segment of FNF until you come and join us to give us all the spicy post recap commentary. Oh, I mean, I have um, I got opinions on some of this because uh, I know yeah. <laughs> Well, so, have a good night, and uh, we got one more witness to talk about. Good night, uh, friends. See you later. Good night. All right. I'm going to move us over to... Um, that is... We got uh, Marissa Popel, who's actually right up now. Let's go find, they're going to go find her. You know, it's great when they're coming up with a great big box of, like, this is a box of legal ammunition, so... You swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, have a seat. Talk about the microphone, please. Apple Silver, not too much longer, but we got to get through this because she's important. State your full name and last name for the record, please. Marissa Popple, P O P P E L L. And how are you currently Popple. employed? I'm a crime scene technician with Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been a crime scene technician with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, with them for almost three years now. And were you a crime scene investigator anywhere else prior to coming to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I was with Fort Myers Police Department in Fort Myers, Florida for four years. So, total time as a crime scene investigator, what do you got? Almost seven years now. How did you become involved in this case? I was notified by my lieutenant in the Criminal Investigations Division that a shooting had occurred and we would be responding as the CID unit. CID means Criminal, Criminal Investigation. Investigation Division. Okay. So she gets called in to do the forensics on the rust shooting, which I mean is that's a big um, that's a big duty. So this was complete on the live rounds. Um, however, the lab does not do DNA on any kind of- Oop, We gotta back up a little bit. Um, DNA swabs that were collected from individuals, um, fingerprints that were collected from individuals, um, and additional ammunition that needed uh, analyzed at that time. Did you consider having fingerprints or DNA analysis done on it's the It's certainly, live rounds? people can judge the accused that, based um, on how you analysis look. analysis was complete on the live rounds. Um, however, the lab does not do DNA on any kind of ammunition. And because that's standard it's exhibits most, uh, that they're planning labs. on getting Do you know through. why DNA isn't collected from uh, basically what I'm going to describe as casings, brass casings? It's just a very small likelihood of getting enough uh, cells to have enough for a profile to be developed, which is why they won't do it. Okay, thank you. Um, so you couldn't actually have them take DNA off those uh, live rounds? Correct. They wouldn't do it? Yes. Okay. They told you no? Yes. <laughs> This is closing off an argument that defense counsel is going to make. Defense counsel is going to be like, why didn't you get DNA? Well, now they've they've already explained it, right? Uh, we don't get DNA because it's, you just don't get it off of this, right? Um, lots of jurors now expect DNA evidence in places that it isn't necessarily going to appear. All right, they're going to go through that for a while. Let's talk about um, let's talk about ammo because she's got a lot to say about ammo. That was inside of that ammunition box. And when it was inside the box, when you collected it, what did it have in it? It had uh, multiple uh, defense would have box. gotten okay. copies of everything That's beforehand. How long it takes to do it? Seventy-six. I'm gonna. Do that and dismiss Zora for the night. Thank you, Zora. Tell us what uh, State's Exhibit 76 is. This is a 4440 uh, dummy round. Do you know where it came from? 
This was inside the foam insert in the ammunition box. How do you know it's a dummy round? When you shake it, you hear ball bearings inside of the round. So this is something to be aware of. 4440 is a different cartridge than 45 Long Colt. And you need to be real careful that you're loading the right ammo into a gun because you can have real problems if you load the wrong ammo into a gun. Can everybody hear that? Let's have a look at State's Exhibit 77. I like the, uh, can everyone hear that? <laughs> Where'd I put my dummies? I better not have lost them. That'd be a real dumb thing to do. What are we looking at here? This is a 45 dummy round that has been um, deconstructed by the FBI. And what's in the little plastic container? So that is the ball bearing that was inside of this round. Okay, so this is just an example of what that looks like when you take it apart. Yes. All right. Tell us, here, let me, let me get State's Exhibit 78. What do we have here? This is a 45 dummy round, but instead of having a ball bearing inside of it, it has a hole drilled through the side of it to distinguish it as a dummy round. So when you shake this dummy round, does it rattle? No. And the dummy rounds that rattle, do they have holes in the side? No. So it either has a hole in the side or it rattles? Yes. Okay. States Exhibit 79. Now, I'm just going to say, I would really want to not have a variety of different... Um, you know, different kinds of dummies, but I mean, I could see a reason to have both of those kinds because you might need something that looks like it's got a primer for a particular shot, but um, you still got to check. And before you put an, a round into a gun, you know, you've got a round, right? You've got a, you got a thing. Before you put it into the gun, you got to be sure that it's a dummy. And uh, a lot of the ones that have a hole drilled in the side still do rattle. You just put a bigger ball bearing than the hole you drill. So, yeah. Uh, somebody says, is Baldwin coming in? He's not going to be testifying in this. Yeah. Tell us what we're looking at. This is a 45 live round that was located inside of that same ammo box. How do you know it's a live round? Inside the plastic cylinder is all of the gunpowder that the uh, FBI forensics lab took out when they deconstructed the round. So, live round. Why are they finding live rounds here? Can you see that? Yes. I know it's hard because of the glare. Maybe that's a little bit better. Um, what is that silver thing on the top? Do you know what that's called? That would be the primer. And is it silver or nickel? Yes, it's silver. Starline brass, folks. Um, very common brass. You see it's marked 45 Long Colt. States Exhibit 80. Uh, Lisa, that's a bad idea. What is States Exhibit 80? This is the other box of ammunition that was located in Lieutenant Benavides' vehicle. Um, did you personally inspect what was in that box? Yes. And what is that box full of? Uh, each of these rounds is a blank round, meaning instead of a projectile on the head, they have kind of a crimped end to them. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit 81. Yep, trust no one, allow no one to touch, everyone is dumb. Keep everything locked away. I mean, you could, but um, it it dents the primers if you want to keep them looking like, uh, you know, unmarked primers. States Exhibit 81. What are we looking at? This is a 4440 dummy round that was taken out of a box marked 3840. And what does 4440 mean, if you know? Um, that would be the caliber of the round. So is a 4440 different than a 45? Yes. I'm going to show you uh, what we marked as States Exhibit 82. What's that? This is a 3840 taken out of that same box marked 3840. This is a 3840. Yes. That was in the box. So this is really, really damaging. 
Um, she's got a box that is marked 3840, which is like a neck down cartridge. Um, and in that there's a 4440. Um, so 3840 is a Winchester cartridge. I believe it's a neck down 4440. Um, but, and neck down is, you can see where it's, um, you know, sort of pinches in and, um, like this little pinching in thing is the necking down. Uh, so that allows you to get sort of more powder with a smaller diameter. So, um, you shouldn't have a 4440 in the box of 3840. That is extremely careless to have like, yeah, um, that is, that's a really bad idea. Mark 3840. Yes. And what else was in the box? 4440s. And the, where were the 3840 dummy rounds found? I believe they were in a bag in the prop shop. Okay. And inside the bag, were they just loose? They were in an ammo box in the bag. Did you find 3840 dummy rounds in any other location? I don't believe so. Okay. Does it rattle? Yes. This is a good question. What would happen if you put the wrong kind of ammo in a firearm? There are several options. Option number one is it just doesn't chamber. Um, so you can't close the bolt on it. You can't whatever. It won't work. That's one possibility. Option number two is it doesn't function because it like it's too small and it f rattles around in there. Option number three is it fires but is damaging to the gun. That happens with certain cartridges. Option number four is you blow up your gun. Um, it can be extremely dangerous. There are certain calibers that if you get them wrong, you will blow your shit up. So um, don't do it. Um, so, yeah. States Exhibit 83. What are we looking at here? This is a 45 dummy round taken from a box of ammunition located in the prop truck. Going back to Hannah, we don't need to see Hannah right now. Hannah's not doing anything important. I'm going to show you what uh, we've previously looked at, but it states Exhibit 78. And I don't know how well you can see because of the glare. But... Yeah, this is a good point. Um, you can shoot 38 Special out of a 357 Magnum gun, but you can't shoot a 357 Magnum out of a 38 Special gun. Correct. Um, so I've got a revolver that shoots 357 Magnum. You can load it, load it with 38 Special, which is a weaker um, cartridge. And it's cheaper to shoot. It's a little more pleasant to shoot, but um, yeah. Um, but folks will be able to actually look at them. Yeah, uh, Maya was gross. There's a difference between 78 and 83 visibly. Can you tell them apart? Um, there is, uh, can I see the bottoms of them as well? Yeah, and, and, and let me ask you, um, let me back up for a moment. The box that 83 came out of, how many other rounds were in that box, if you recall? Um, there were 17 rounds in total in that box. And what color primers did all of those have? Silver. And was there any other distinguishing characteristics about those dummy rounds compared to the other ones? And I'm not talking about projectile. Uh, they all had a patine to them. It's so almost a discoloration. So they were made to look old. A patine? And when you say a that, are you patina? talking about the brass was actually a different color? Yes. Okay. Um, and those... The dummy rounds that you found, uh, that, that you collected, that had that patine to them. She's got to use the same word the witness primers? did. 
<clears throat> sorry, yes. <clears throat> Did you find any other dummy rounds on set other than the ones that have the patine to them that had silver primers dummy rounds? Now I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking sorry, I want there were poutine. Any other, any other dummy rounds poutine. that had a silver primer to them? Other than the ones that had the patine? No. Poutine. So only the patine colored dummies had silver primers. Yes. Okay. By the way, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, poutine is a, uh, you know, French fries and gravy and cheese curds and is amazing if it's good. How about Steaks Exhibit 84? Yes, they mean they mean patina. But once the witness says patina, the the lawyer can't correct. Um, All right, states exhibit eighty four. What is that? So this is another forty five a dummy dummy round with a silver primer. And is it patine? Yes. I'm going to show you what is states exhibit eighty three. It's a little hard to see through the plastic, mm. but is there a difference between uh, 83 and 84? No, they are both patined. Is there a difference in the projectile? Uh, one projectile is slightly larger than the other right on the nose area. And when you're looking at those, uh, when they're not in the plastic, can you tell that pretty easily? Yes. Mm. <laughs> and just for completeness, States exhibit 85. What are we looking at there? This is another 45 dummy round taken from that same box that has been deconstructed by the FBI. And we can see that there were BBs inside of it. Yes. All right. So prior Two to BBs. being deconstructed, it would rattle. It would rattle. Okay, thanks. Uh, do you have states exhibit 86? Get in cereal. Yes, they do, but it's hard to find good poutine. Now, a lot of this is, you might be saying, why are they taking so much time on all of these, um, um, on all of these bullets? They're, they're, they have to introduce them into evidence, right? They have to introduce them, um, you know, they have to get them properly admitted. So, yeah. I'm showing you what we've marked as States Exhibit 86. Can you tell us what that is? This is a 45 dummy round on the side of it. It has a hole drilled into it, and there is no primer on it. Let's see if I can manipulate this so we can see what we're looking at. Is that a hole you're referring to? Yes. And you indicated that it does not have a primer? Correct. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, where we would normally see a primer, instead it has a hole. So how many different kinds of dummy rounds in terms of characteristics that would enable someone to distinguish them from a live round? How many different kinds did you find on set? Uh, there were a few on set, and there's the ones that rattle. There are ones with holes drilled into the side, and there are ones with holes drilled into the side that do not have a primer. Um, first of all, I don't think this is beyond her experience, but they're not objecting. So if the other side isn't objecting, like there's no problem. Um, so yeah, there's no issue here. Now, are you familiar with revolvers and the way that revolvers work? Yes. If a revolver is loaded with rounds, can you see the hole in the side? No. When you, when you look at the revolver? If you are looking at it from the angle of you've loaded the cylinder, no, you won't be able to see the side of the rounds. This is like, these are the sort of basic fundamental stupid questions that you have to ask, because if you don't ask, then they're not part of evidence, right? Um, they're not, you know, you might say, obviously you can't see the, um, Obviously, you can't see the side of the uh, 
of the cartridge when it's loaded into a gun. But, and, you know, mm, you still got to ask it. And I hate these questions because they're easy to miss. And the what jurors may be idiots. They you may have never the dealt with a gun. So, if a gun was loaded with... I agree with this. Bacon and syrup are two great tastes, but they should not be together. Would you be able to tell that it had dummy rounds in it without taking them out of the cylinder? Yes. What would a bullet do if it didn't have a primer, even if it had gunpowder inside? There would be no reaction uh, because there'd be nothing for it, uh, the hammer to hit. The okay. to hit. It wouldn't fire, right? Correct. Okay. And States Exhibit 87. What's that? So this is a different type of dummy round that was located. Yeah, uh, It's a 45, but it's actually made as a replica round. Um, you can see where there was a hole drilled in the side and then it was filled in. And <laughs> can you see the hole that was filled in right there? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Does it rattle? No, it does not. And it doesn't have a hole in the side because it's been filled in, right? Correct. What does the primer look like? The primer is intact and it's brass, but it does have a shine to it, almost like there was a resin polish put over it. Can I just tell you how much this scares the shit out of me? Like, we are using dummies that look exactly like real rounds, but the thing is that this still shouldn't cause any danger because there is no way you should load this into a gun. Like, if you, for some reason, felt the need to make a... Um, and I could see some scenes that you might film with something that is exactly like... Um, you know, if you had somebody who's got, like, a handful of ammunition who tosses it out um, onto a table or something, and there's a, a close-in shot, so you can't have a hole in it, you can't have anything like that in it. Um, maybe. But you still should never actually load this into a gun, right? If you can't tell that it's a dummy, it doesn't go in a gun, like, ever. So, yeah. Uh, not knowing anything about guns doesn't make a person an idiot. That's true. But plenty of jurors will still be idiots. That is still an option. Um, and also, I mean... This isn't even like a not knowing things about guns. This is just like, if you put a thing in a tube, do you see the sides of the thing? Right? Um, can't they just edit the hole out? No, not really. Um, it'll look awful. Um, CGI for like tumbling objects is really difficult. So, yeah. The primer right there? Yes, it is. So if it doesn't rattle and it doesn't have a hole in the side and it isn't missing a primer, how do you know it's a dummy round? So even when a live round is shaken, you can hear the powder inside of it move. So this, this round in particular makes absolutely no sound when you shake it. So somebody says, why wouldn't you just make an empty cartridge instead of drilling it out? It's probably that they made an empty cartridge and then they drilled it out so that it's got an obvious sign that it's an empty cartridge, right? Um, that, that is what you, uh, like the drilling it out isn't to empty it because you wouldn't want to drill out a live cartridge. That would be dangerous. You drill the hole in it to make it visibly obvious that it is, um, that okay. it's, you know, not a live cartridge. What else do you have there? Um, let's look at 88, States Exhibit 88. Yeah, you won't hear the powder shake around in Bubba's super load. If somebody packs it uh, so packs it tight, you wouldn't hear it. Ma'am, when you were participating in the execution of the search warrant on the prop truck, did you locate a lever action rifle? Yes, I did. So for the folks who don't know what a lever action rifle is, these would be really common to appear on a cowboy action or cowboy, you know, Western movie. 
Uh, lever action, like a bolt action, you open the bolt, you slide the bolt back, you push the bolt in, you, you know, close it up. Uh, lever action has a lever typically at the underside of the gun. So you shoot and then you work the lever and then you shoot again. Um, so that is a different style of manual action firearm. Um, I want to get a lever action. I want to get a 357 lever action. Um, they're just expensive. Now I'm going to shop for lever actions. Was law enforcement able to easily clear it, meaning make it safe? No. Why not? We were not able to unload it on scene uh, because the firearm appeared to be jammed somehow. Uh, so it was taken back to our office uh, for our firearms uh, certified individuals to, to handle. And do you know what kind of ammunition that lever action rifle is supposed to take? Yes, it's supposed to take 4440s. And the ammunition that was taken out of that lever action rifle, did you collect it? Yes. And do we have it here as 88 and 89? Yes. I'm going to show you what we've marked as States Exhibit 89. What are those? So these are the three 4440 rounds that were inside of the rifle. And are so at least rounds? they were 4440s. Yes. And do you see um, any distinguishing characteristics that you can see from the outside to let you know that it's a 4440 and not 45? So the 4440s have almost an elongation to their casing area. So you can see where they slightly tighten up in one area and then continue upwards. So yes, right where you're pointing. And did you say that you found a 45 in there or not yet? I don't remember. Okay. What what is what is State's Exhibit 88? It is a 45 dummy round that was located inside that same rifle. Do you notice anything um, different about this? Did you catch that? The 4440 rifle was loaded with 4440, but also loaded with a 45 long colt. Oh my freaking god. Oh my freaking god. Um <laughs> Yeah. Um this right here tells us that Hannah is a chuckle fuck. Like this So I just want to address uh one theory that has been floating around out there. Um the theory is that this was some conspiracy that somebody snuck a live cartridge in to thwart Hannah or whatever else. And I'm going to say, I don't think that's the case because we see so much chuckle fuckery here. If you were trying to sabotage things, you would bring like one live cartridge or a handful of live cartridges and you'd like salt those in to create a problem. Um, what you wouldn't do is have all these problems, right? Because then it's super noticeable. Assuming Hannah is like conscious and has two brain cells that occasionally meet in a dark alley and chat. Like this is just, you know, there was the wrong ammunition mixed into boxes for sorting. There's the wrong ammunition loaded into guns. Uh, James Mueller, yes, they are. Um, this isn't a management problem. This isn't a sabotage problem. This is Hannah was fucking the dog. Not literally, just figuratively. <sighs> Stunning round than the other ones. There is some uh, damage done to the projectile head of this round. Uh, where it was forcefully removed from the rifle. So basically they had to yeet that out. Dummy, does it fit in that lever action rifle? It does not fit in a 44-40 rifle. All right. What else do we have? Is that the last item? Yes, it is. All right. Uh, I'm not going to take it out of the bag, but for, for right now, what is uh, State's Exhibit 90? 
So this is a shoulder holster that was located inside of the building. Do you know which actor used this prop? Yes, this belonged to Alec Baldwin. You collected this from a scene? Yes. You took a whole lot of photos, right? Yes. We're going to switch over to pictures from Elmo. Elmo? Who the f is Elmo? I think Elmo is their program, but... <laughs> now, you saw her, like, looking nervous there. I'm just going to say, I would not ever want to be sitting in a room where they're talking about me doing this crap. Like, live your life in a way that you don't have to sit where she is, because... Um, Hmm, this would be, um, this would be awkward. This would be unpleasant. So, yeah. Now you guys got me looking at lever actions. I blame you, chat. Now I'm looking at 357s. Can I get a 357? Uh, without objection, I would ask the court to admit states exhibits three through 73. No objection, Your Honor. States three through 73 are admitted. Thank you, sir. Oh, people want like two grand for them. Christ. Okay. I'm showing you uh, what has been admitted as States Exhibit 3. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? This is the prop truck that was located outside of the main building of the scene. You said prop truck. Oh, I apologize. Prop cart. Okay. Um, that does not look like a truck. And is this the condition it was in when you took your, your photo? Yes. Did you inspect this cart and remove items from it? Yes, I did. Would you describe the level of organization uh, associated with this cart? There were multiple rounds. Would you describe the level of organization? She's like, um, the level of organization is um, pigeon business. Um, pigeon business. So. Of multiple caliber uh, all over the top portion of this cart and additional boxes of rounds on the bottom part of this cart. And were there also just other items? Yes, there were uh, plastic guns, uh, gun belts, earplugs, miscellaneous paperwork. Oops. Let's do it this way. It'll be easier. Somebody says that good leather work. I can't really tell from... Is that from, just a, uh, a, another okay, uh, photograph of that same prop cart? Yes, just a, at a different angle. And what are we looking at there? Here we can see... The I mean, this prop cart would be well organized if somebody had like, you know... This is what you would expect a prop cart to look like after somebody has rolled it down a flight of stairs. The uh, spent cartridge casing that was located on top of the cart, as well as uh, additional ammunition that was located there. Okay. And that spent casing that we're looking at, um, you collected it from the cart? Yes. And did you send it to the FBI? Yes. Thank you. States exhibit Don't listen, five. Mrs. Runkle. Uh, it's totally this? the chat's fault. This is fault. a close-up of the bottom portion of the cart. States exhibit six. A different angle of the top of the cart. Uh, the leather work doesn't look too bad. It looks pretty good. I'm going to zoom in. Um, the Can edging right is kind of dog yes. shit. What is but, that um, the lower right-hand corner? It is uh, an ammunition round. Not yeah. in a particular box? Not in any box, no. Uh, no, the, the ammunition is dog shit. Six, six, Sorry. Seven, seven. What's that? Or the uh, leather work edging. This is, again, edging. the top of the cart and one of the firearms that was located on top of the cart. I believe this was the one with a blocked cylinder, so it was not a functional firearm. So this was not the gun that was used in this incident? No. Uh, and it states Exhibit 8. Is that just a close-up? Yes. Here's a random what gun that this? This doesn't work. Exhibit 9. What are we looking at? This is the firearm that was used in this incident uh, after it had been collected and put into a 
an evidence box. And this is the firearm that was sent to the FBI? Yes. State's Exhibit 10, what's this? This was the rifle that we were required to bring back to the office to safely unload. This is the one that was jammed? Yes. State's Exhibit 11. These were the rounds that were removed from the rifle. Again, there are three 4440s. And yeah, one fair enough that the leather should look a little rough for the uh, Do you know the why scene? this uh, round here seems to have a shorter projectile than the others? The 4440s uh, all had more square tops, and it, I would assume... Your Honor, I'm going to judge sure. for these speculations. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I'll withdraw that. Um, let's go to State's Exhibit 12. Uh, this is a close-up of the 45 round that was removed from the rifle. Is that the damage that you were talking about? Yes. This is such a State's shit 13, show. This is a close-up of the bottom of that same round. Thank you. And State's Exhibit 14. I need to make this a, a bandolier. This at the bottom of the 4440 rounds. And can you see here on the head stamp, does it say... It says 4440. Thank you. Uh, State's Exhibit 15. What's this? This was all of the ammunition that was loose and not in boxes that was located on top of the cart. And the rounds on top, what are those? Those are all blank rounds, and they can be distinguished by that crimped end instead of having a projectile. And these rounds over here on the left, if you recall, um, were those dummies or not? Um, if I can refer to my report. Sure. So I believe these two rounds uh, were uh, dummy 45 rounds that rattled when shaken. And what about these two rounds over here on the right-hand side? These two rounds uh, were later, uh, I apologize. Um, these two rounds were sent to the FBI because they were suspected live rounds, which the FBI confirmed. So these two rounds here, this picture was taken before they were sent to the FBI. Correct. And these turned out to be live rounds. Yes. Meaning real bullets. Yes. And what's this one down here? This is a dummy 45 round with a hole drilled in the side. And these were just loose on the prop cart? Yes. All of this loose, like live ups. rounds, that dummy is. rounds. Oh Stated my 16, fucking. Seven. Like, this is not a conspiracy. This is not, um, this is not like people planning any. This is just like ammunition party. Like, throw the ammunition everywhere. Oh my God. Like somebody was making it rain with ammo is what this is, you know, like this is beyond unreal. Um, yeah. Why are they even live rounds on a movie shoot? I don't know. But like if you actually like the instant a live round is found, it should shut everything down. But yeah, everybody, this is a good, everybody on this set was playing Russian roulette. Thanks to the armorer, right? That's the armorer. And yeah, the thing is, is even if Seth intentionally gave her live rounds, it would be incompetent for her not to notice that. Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, carrying on. 17, State's Exhibit 18. Is this a, a close-up of something? This is a close-up of the two live rounds. And what is this a picture of? The bottoms of those same rounds with silver primer. State's Exhibit 20. These are the other two dummy rounds that were located on, truck, on the on cart. Do you see a difference? Well, ha have a look at the, at, at the projectile. Um, of these rounds. And then, I'm gonna, this is 20, I'm going to go back to 18. Do you see a difference? On the live rounds, they appear to have a larger nose, so a wider nose area. Did you measure those? Yes. And what, what's, the, what's the diameter of that nose, that flat surface? Six millimeters. What's the diameter of, of, the, uh, uh, of the, the projectile, the tip of the projectile on State's Exhibit 20? Four millimeters. So if you're wondering how they measure it, it's it's calipers. Um, so yeah, was it? She didn't find the live rounds because she was allowing herself to be distracted. She didn't find the live rounds because she wasn't fucking checking. She just wasn't checking for them. Um, just more close-ups. I'm just going through here. Um, States Exhibit Twenty Three. Do you recall what that was? 
I, I do not. It was 24. That's okay. Um, and States Exhibit 25. What's this? This was the uh, spent round located on top of the cart. And, and what is States Exhibit 26? The bottom of that round where you can see the silver primer. Why was this empty casing sent to the FBI? Uh, to determine if it had been fired from the firearm that we had in custody. Okay. And we'll have other folks speak to that. Um, States Exhibit 27. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? This is a close-up of one of the gun belts. Where was this gun belt collected from? I believe this gun belt was on top of the cart. The prop cart? Yes. <clears throat> um, were any of these rounds sent to the FBI? Yes. Which one? The one with the silver primer. Did that turn out to be a live round? Yes. Do you recall God. what actor used that gun belt? I believe this belt was assigned to Jensen Ackles. And let's look at State's Exhibit. Jensen Ackles. They gave him a bandolier with a live round on it. I'm just going to note here, uh, there is a very, re like, had Baldwin not shot somebody, there is the possibility that Jensen Ackles could have. Um, Jensen Ackles should be pissed as hell, except that Jensen Ackles is more careful. Jensen Ackles has indicated that he insists on testing. He insists on being shown when he's handed a gun because Jensen Ackles is a better human being. So why would Jensen Ackles not find this? Because it's not, you know, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> 27A, what is this a photo of? Uh, this was ammunition that was located from the top of the cart. Is it the same ammunition that came from that belt? Yes. Okay. Um, and why do you have it separated out like this? So this ammunition was separated out based on its physical description. So we have ammunition at the top, that's 45s with brass primers. We have one round by itself, which was 45 with a silver primer, and one round by itself, which was 45 with a hole drilled through the side. So all of these turned out to be dummies except this one here on the left. Correct. Oh, God. States Exhibit 28, what's this? This was a fanny pack that was located on top of that same cart. States Exhibit 29, what is this a picture of? This is a close-up of the inside of that uh, bag. And what are those things we're looking at? I believe all of these rounds that we're looking at now were blank rounds that were found in the bag. Okay. And did this bag have more than one pocket? Yes. States Exhibit 30, what are we looking at here? This is another pocket uh, in this pack uh, containing blank rounds. And States Exhibit 31. Another pocket in the same bag with blank rounds inside. And States Exhibit 32. This is inside that bag with a dummy round 45 with a hole drilled through the side of it. And let me ask you, how many dummy rounds altogether did you collect from that crime scene? I believe, as far as dummy rounds go, I believe I have 255. And does that include the prop cart? Yes. Of those 255, Approximately how many were not located in a box and not located on a gun belt? I would say probably around 50. One one fifth of of the ammo, you know, of the dummies that they found just found wherever. Um, somebody says, Runkle, should ammo be kept like this? If you kept ammo like this in Canada, it would be a criminal offense. Simply the ammo storage um, would be a criminal offense. Um, somebody says, do they really need that many dummies? Yes, they do. Um, you got to, you know, deck out all those bandoliers. You got to deck out a bunch of, you know, bunch of guns, etc. cetera. Uh, like, you know, if I kept my live ammo just scattered like this, um, I would be chargeable. Um, I keep my ammo locked in a locked in a safe, right? Um, uh, blank so still up powder. Yeah. Were they just loose in different places? Yes. Yeah, too many dummies on the set. The problem is, it's not the two hundred and fifty dummies that they found that was the problem. It's the dummies, like the two-legged dummies was, was the problem. Too many of those. Where were some of the places that you found loose rounds? 
Um, they were found loose yeah, in the I'm a little, boxes, uh, uh, loose inside of the boxes. He was probably box, bound by contract. Floor, um, pretty much any boxes that were located, if there were ammo boxes inside of it, there were loose rounds also underneath the ammo boxes. All right. Uh, States Exhibit 33. I think these are close-ups. We can go through them quickly. 33 and 34, can you can you see what that is? Yes, this is a close-up of that uh, dummy round that has the hole drilled through the side. Okay. States Exhibit 35. This is the bottom of that dummy round where the primer has been removed. So this is a dummy round that was taken out of that fanny pack. Yes. States Exhibit 36. What is this a photo of? This is a close-up of one of the uh, gun belts. Let's talk about this one for a moment. Um, what actor was using this um, holster as a prop? This holster was assigned to Alec Baldwin. And are we looking in this picture at all of the rounds that were located in that gun belt? Yes. I see that on the left, we have two rounds with silver primers. I'm gonna ask you about the first one. Uh, this first round that my uh, pointer is on, did that was that a dummy round? Yes. Why is this a different color than the other rounds? This round had that patine wear look to it that we had previously seen. So the dummy rounds with the patine. Now guys, patine is like, there is a word that is patine, but it is a verb. It is to apply a patina to something. This is frustrating me. Looked like this from the top. Yes. This round right here next to it, was that a dummy round? No. What did that turn out to be? That turned out to be a live round. And these three here, these three rounds to the right, um, what did those turn out to be? Uh, two of those were 44-40 rounds, and one of them was a uh, 45 dummy round with ball bearings inside. Were they all dummy rounds? All three of these, yes. Okay. Uh, the only live round that was found in Mr. Baldwin's uh, holster is this one right here? Yes. And you sent that to the FBI? Yes. Oh, uh, live rounds States everywhere. Exhibit 37, what is this? This is a different view of that same holster. It's not a holster. It's a gun belt. Is this the live round right here? Yes. I want you to look at this projectile. Is this projectile different than this one to the right? Yes. And is it different than the one next to that one? Yes. And is it different than this one? Yes. How is it different than this one? If you're wondering why they're going through, is this projectile different than the, you know, whatever else? It's because they want to point out that if you were supposedly a firearms expert, maybe you should have noticed this, right? Um, because Hannah's going to get up and saying like, oh, well, I didn't, you know, I couldn't tell. Well, it's like, well, aren't you supposed to be the expert in firearms on this set? So, yeah. The one that your pointer is on right now has a more uh, elongated nose to it, which makes it a smaller nose width. And what's the measurement of that nose width? Four millimeters. And this round over here on the far left. And guys, when we get to the end, I'll go through all of the super chats that I haven't gone through. Yes. So what's that? The projectile on the far left has almost a crimping around the base of it. I want to ask you about green. all of the suspected nice. live rounds that you found on set and sent to the FBI. Did they all look like this one? Yes. Did they all have silver primers? Yes. Did they all have the same head stamp? Yes. What is that head stamp? It states 45 Colt and has a Starline Brass logo. And did they all have the same shape projectile? Yes. Did they all have the same color brass? Yes. Meaning they were not patine? Correct. Okay. States Exhibit 38. What are we looking at here? These are those same rounds from the holster removed from the holster. So we just get a better view of uh, the, the casing. Correct. All right. States Exhibit 39. This was a gun belt that was located inside of the prop truck. And what what kind of rounds uh, were were in this belt? Uh, if I can refer to my report. Sure. Uh, in this belt were 22 45 Colt rounds with ball bearings inside and one uh, Spain Denix replica round. And do we have the Spain Denix replica round here in evidence? Yes. And all of the rounds in this gun belt, did they all have the patine color? Yes. And were any of them found to be live? No. States Exhibit 40. These are those same rounds removed from the gun belt. Thank you. States now, I Exhibit mean, 41. So defense is going to be making the argument of like, well, how would she have known, right? And it's like, 
this is literally her job is to prevent this scene, this shit from happening, right? It's like, you know, how could you have known that this is a bad scene at the zoo? And I'm like, um, literally the tiger is eating the giraffe. So um, that is a thing that should never happen at a well-run zoo. And so if your tiger is eating your giraffe, you know something is wrong at the zoo. Um, you know, it's like if you walk into the bank and you see money just like raining everywhere, you're like, maybe this is not the bank that is going to be a secure place to deposit my investments. Um, me, like, <sighs> yeah. It's like, you know, if you go to a mechanic and they're like, we had brake lines that were real brake lines. And we also had brake lines that look like real brake lines, but will break and cause you to die. It's like, ooh. This is a close up of the silver primer on the rounds. What states exhibit 42? This was a box of ammunition collected from the prop truck. Is this the condition it was in when you collected it? Yes. States Exhibit 43, what's this? This is a close-up of a different box located in the prop truck. And what's in all those white boxes? Uh, different types of ammunition. And what's this here? I believe it was a Red Bull. All right. <laughs> what's this here? Oh, it's a Red Bull. You know, because that's where you keep a Red Bull. Um, that's, that's just where you store that. Um, I mean, the Red Bull isn't dangerous. Nobody's going to be harmed by the Red Bull. But, um, hmm, still, still, uh, I got, I got my concerns. I got my thoughts, got my feelings. What states exhibit 44? This was a Mary Kay bag that was located in the prop truck. Stylish. And what's in these white boxes? Uh, various types of ammunition. And we can see some brass things down here in this little pocket. Do you know what those were? I believe those were spent blanks. And we'll go through these quickly. States Exhibit 44A. This was a close-up of the ammunition in that bag. What do we see over here? Uh, where your arrow cursor is? Yeah. Uh, I believe this is a spent blank, or I'm sorry, uh, spent blank rounds. And were they just loose in the bag? Yes. I mean, she can see that they're just loose in the bag, but yeah. <sighs> We're going to break for the day, okay? So follow George. Take your tablets. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Do not read any stories about the trial or any subject matter um, related to this case. Do not and, watch um, Runkle. I mean, he's fascinating. He's entertaining. All right. But do not. Okay, let's do that. Um, so, tomorrow, she's going to resume. They got more questions for her. Um, I'm sure that those questions are going to be, you know, more of this. Now, if I'm defense team, I don't know what to do with this witness. This witness is a problem because... You should watch Runkle unless you are a juror. Jurors do not watch Runkle until after the trial, in which case you are entitled to both watch Runkle and if you want, you can leave a super thanks, which is like a super chat. It just happens after the stream is done. So um, how would I deal with this witness? This is a tough question. I mean, you might try to shake her a bit. You might try to be like, well... I mean, one thing you might say is like, you don't know that this prop cart was in this kind of disarray, you know, during filming. It was just like that that dude dragged it over that, you know, we're going to blame that dude who hauled the prop cart over and he, um, you know, he mixed it up. 
Um, Apple Silver, I'm not taking that bet. I think a not guilty is a substantial possibility. I just think that it shouldn't happen in an ideal world, but that doesn't mean it won't happen in the world we live in. Um, yeah, guys, um, if you could, if you're still here watching, please like this video, share with your friends, subscribe to see more content, um, all of those things. Um, and so, I mean, this is one of the arguments is just like defense is going to say, you don't know what the deal was with this prop cart. You don't know what the deal is. You don't know where this ammo came from, right? You don't know. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot of, you don't know this, right? Um, so yeah, I, and I see the live belts and the various uh, belts, his fault. They're going to say, you don't know how those got there, right? You don't know who put those in there. Is it possible, you know, is it possible so-and-so put them in there? Is it possible so-and-so else put them in there? Um, I should invite Dean Clifford on for a q and I don't know Dean Clifford. Do I know Dean Clifford? Do I? I might. Um, Anyway, tomorrow I'll have some additional thoughts because I was asking uh, an armor about those replica cartridges, right? And going, hey, is there a reason why those would exist? So I'm going to find that out before we uh, before we go. Um, yeah, the 44 lever gun had that had a 45 long Colt in it. All of this makes no sense. James C is saying, what about cocaine? We're not going to hear about the cocaine yet. Cocaine is going to come later. But I think that the um, I think defense counsel is going to say we don't know how the live ammunition got in here. It's a mess because she was overworked and given not enough time. Maybe other people were doing some of the jobs and they made a mess, too. Um, you know, she might get up on the stand and say, I didn't make this mess. It was, you know. Uh, Seth Kenny and it was Sarah Zachary and it was Dave Halls and it was cocaine bear. And it was, you know, the Easter bunny and Santa and, you know, Jack the Ripper all messed with my shit. Um, so we, we don't know. Um, somebody says, is it a whiskey night? What are you drinking? I broke out some decent whiskey. Um, I broke out a two brewers. Uh, this is a Canadian uh, single malt whiskey. It is good stuff. It's expensive. Um, but I kind of needed a better... I needed a better whiskey for this. So, um, yeah. Dave Hall is a witness. Yes, he's a prosecution witness. Uh, they're going to be calling him. Um, all right, let's go through Super Chat. Some of them I read live. Ryanman YYC, thank you so much for the gifted memberships. Much appreciated. L. Elizabeth, thank you for the YouTube membership. Uh, Fat Yoga, hey, Runkle in chat. Hey, Fat Yoga, I'm sorry I didn't pull this up earlier. I hope you're still here. Uh, the Chugi Show, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, live. I used to direct films, and certainly things are wild to me. Or uh, I Apparently, my memory differs for what it means for Hannah to be on set or not to be on set. Yeah, um, lots of people who do film stuff have been like, what the... F so, aka the Cat Lady, welcome aboard. Thank you so much. Diana B, been waiting for your recaps on this case. I have been eager to do the recap because this scene pisses me off. Um, this scene pisses me off. Kyle Fox says, uh, if she was IATSE Union, she would know that her duty to her brothers and sisters would be to say no to anything dangerous. Yep. Um, you say no because it's literally other people's life on the line. Right. So, um, yep. Uh, Kate Harlan uh, J. Thank you for the membership. Much appreciated. Ryan man. YYC rehab success today. Walked enough stairs to get from basement to the top floor of my house. Fantastic. Ryan man. We are all our uh, rain man. Rather. We are all cheering for you. We're all hoping you do fantastic. Um, awesome. So, uh, just Rubery, what are your thoughts on the cop collecting the gun with the bullets already removed and missing? I mean, they didn't have much option. I mean, that they were already removed and missing. But, like, I would be pissed if I was the cop. Like, where did... Who messed with this? I would have been, like... I, I would have been trying to run down who messed with this. Um, I see Rackets live now. We'll, uh, we'll be wrapped up soon. You can go check out Rackets. 
Uh, Marvin CZ that says, thanks for the recap. I don't have time to watch it all live. I got to watch it all live so that you guys maybe don't have to. So, yeah. Fiona W., thank you for 10 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Um, and Don Shute, thank you for uh, for joining up. Much appreciated. Jack Lind, a question. Should lawyers follow the writing advice of less is more to make sure their openings and closing are as tight and only go on as long as absolutely needed? He sounds like he's rambling. Yes and no. Sometimes there's stuff you've got to cover, even though it's not super interesting. Like they got to cover the, um, they got to cover the difference between blanks, dummies and live. They've got to do that. That's important shit. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, they still like, it's boring. So you got to do that. You just got to make sure you end well and so forth. Wear a bee necklace. Um, maybe except somebody's dog might step on it. So, uh, Creek, thank you for the new membership. Much appreciated. Um, uh, and Bell Feinstein, can KVB join you on stream? Um, not today. KVB had some stuff going on. Maybe if, uh, if desired later, but KVB has worked as, you know, an armor might in the future. And, there's reasons why armors don't really want to touch this. So, uh, yeah. Um, KVB is welcome, but not like required. So Kyle Fox, SAG is the actors union and has some sort of duty to defend their members. Yeah. I think that their behavior has been a little weird here. Lots to learn. Thank you for the super sticker. Uh, Carson Pratt, speaking of your hot sauce, when can we buy it? When it is warm enough that I can ship it and I get my purchase thing lined up. Emma Zay, thank you for five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Steve A, if it bleeds, it leads. Exists for a reason. Yep. Uh, Corus is requirements of an armorer who's responsible. Um, ultimately, the armorer is responsible for everything gun related on, uh, you know, on a film set, right? Everything gun related goes to the armorer. Um, and part of the duties includes telling. You know, telling people who make many times your salary, no. You know, well, I'm the producer and this is, you know, a, a you know, a $500 million film. It's like, um, tough shit. I'm the person who's making, you know, $20,000 on this film. And I tell you, go fuck yourself. Right. So, um, that's, that's how that works. So, yeah. Uh, Koru, who, who does the hiring? Is that person not responsible? Ultimately, the person who takes the job has the responsibility. So, yeah. Uh, DSN, thank you for five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Uh, and this one was one I just marked because my biggest issue from today is why was the gun empty when given to the police officer? Where did the ammo go and who took it out and why? Certainly the prosecution seems to be hinting that maybe it was Hannah who did that. Defense, I think, is going to suggest maybe it was Sarah Zachary. Um, there's going to be arguments about this. Who messed with the gun and why did they mess with it? Ann Bell Feinstein, same rules as the Paltrow trial. Show the speaker. Yeah, although in the Paltrow trial, they'd be like, yeah, we've got Owens talking and he is in the upper, upper, you know, upper left corner. And then, you know, it's really focused on Paltrow. Like, yeah. Catherine Fraser, the chaos is overwhelming and the jury feels this. Yep, I think so. Steve A, I feel like I'm losing IQ points just hearing how stupid Hannah was with live dummy blank ammo in this set. Yeah. Um, Bambarina, thank you so much for the YouTube membership. Much appreciated. IFQs, thank you for the 10 gifted membership. Hugely appreciated. Thank you. Pants, I hope Baldwin realized at some point during production there were probably dummy loaded guns pointed at him. Yeah, I hope he... Uh, I hope this is a rough thing for him. Chuggy Show Live says, uh, we see I consider her on set because she was physically there on the filming site. She just wasn't in the building itself. But I got boos down another chat. Nobody should be booing you. Um, nobody should be booing you. That's, um, yeah. All right. So uh, people are saying, is hot sauce legal in Canada? Yes. Yes, it is. So that's day one. Day two is going to begin with our... Um, with this firearms tech prosecution's got more to ask her. And then once she's done, 
once the prosecutor's done, it gets handed over to defense, and it'll be really easy to see what happens. Um, Apple Silver, what's your theory on the live rounds? My theory is that they were short. Um, one of two things. Either they were short on ammo, and they brought in live rounds thinking, oh, yeah, we can just put the live rounds in the bandoliers, and they'll stay there. But because there was such disorganization, it went everywhere. Or she got like boxes of ammo, probably from Thel Reed, but possibly from somewhere else, and that they had bad shit mixed in. So, yeah. Um, does Canadian money smell like maple syrup? Some people say it does, actually, and I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, all right. So I am going to wrap this up because I need to get a little bit of sleep, um, at least a couple of hours before... Uh, before tomorrow, because tomorrow is going to be another day of this. Tomorrow, we are going to do this recap a little sooner. And the reason why we're going to do that a little sooner is I like FNF as much as you guys do, and I want to do the recap and then join FNF. So um, let's, um, let's make that happen. All right. So thank you guys all for joining me. That's our show for tonight. And um, tomorrow, we'll do another recap. So... Um, all right, cheers. Mm -hmm.